Started. Thanks so much for coming. And this is uh, the Penn Wharton Budget Model's uh, first uh, spring event here at the, the Great Capital. Uh, well, the, the Visitor Center is really great to be here. And really, the intent here is simply to bring uh, together policymakers, business leaders, academics, to uh, and capital staffers to talk through a lot of contemporary issues. Um, it relates to kind of evidence-based policy making. And so we're going to talk about certainly a lot of issues that are, are in the news now, um, but we're also going to be talking about some frontier issues of how do we think about uh, doing government policy and data and, and uh, uh, using advanced tools uh, and really uh, making government more accessible, not just to capital staffers, that's a big uh, issue, but also uh, to... Um, uh, the general public. So I had some uh, remarks, uh, introductory uh, remarks. I'll skip a lot of these <laughs> because of time. We've got a little bit of a later start. You see, you see the program in, in front of you, but uh, 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 roughly speaking, the first half of the day, um, up until lunchtime, we're going to be talking about advances in tools, um, uh, both data and tools for uh, uh, anal uh, analyzing government policy. So I'll introduce Steve Ballmer and his uh, project in USA Facts in just a little bit. The lunchtime conversation will be held in the atrium right behind us. That's the room that you walked through and had, had breakfast in. We also have an overflow room because this room is much bigger than that room um, and room 201 um, if there is a need, a need for that. And then the afternoon is going to actually be really interesting. We're going to be talking about uh, the... Uh, infrastructure, both data and physical infrastructure, um, and you know a lot of money is lost every year in terms of uh, cybersecurity. We'll, we'll be talking about that, but also the public physical in infrastructure. Uh, we'll be talking about that as well. Now we'll be, we'll be talking, uh, concluding the day with discussions about uh, things like machine learning, blockchain, artificial intelligence. They've become buzzwords. What do they really mean? Are they really useful tools? for you know, government decision uh, making. And we'll show in some cases they are. They can uh, help with uh, dealing with regulatory overlap and understanding regulations at a deeper level. Um, but then they can also, uh, in some cases, they're they, a little exaggerated as well. And so we want to uh, really understand the boundaries uh, uh, behind that. And so for any pres there's a couple of presentations that are done by Penn Wharton Budget Model staff uh, our, ourselves, and uh, other half are done by other people that we've invited in. Whenever a uh, presentation is done by the Penn Wharton Budget Model uh, person, including my own, we invited uh, discussants to come in and uh, to uh, really give comments. And we selected them both on their expertise, they are the leading thought leaders in kind of their area, but also uh, with a uh, a, a role encouragement to be critical, in, in particular, to not hold back uh, anything. So in terms of media coverage, uh, the day will be live streamed, including by uh, Yahoo uh, uh, Finance as well as by Wharton. Uh, one key ex exception will be the lunchtime conversation that will happen at atrium right behind you. That will be an off-the-record discussion uh, 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 with uh, 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 a staffer from uh, uh, Capitol Hill. Uh, because of the staff uh, credentials, that will be off, off the record but a very distinguished uh, uh, a person on the Ways and Means Committee uh, will, will, in fact, uh, have a, a great discussion about trade. It really doesn't need much introduction there. M much of the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, attendance here today is Capitol Hill staff. We understand that a lot of you don't want to ask 
questions on the record in, in uh, using the microphones. So we have index cards that you can fill out and we'll have Penn students coming throughout the audience. They will in fact give, you, uh, you can give them the index card and if for this first session what Steve Ballmer will mainly rely on these index cards uh, because of the way the interview structure will, will work. And so the idea is that you can fill out those cards, we'll make sure your question gets answered and you, you won't have to be in front of a live stream uh, uh, a, a, a camera. Okay, so I kind of skipped through some stuff here, but I think that's okay because we're running a few minutes behind. So let me just uh, start with the introduction of our first uh, 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 session here, and that's with Steve uh, Ballmer. And so you have the speaker bios in your packets. As you know, he uh, started at Microsoft very early in his career, as in fact the, the very first business manager of Microsoft. 20 years later, he became CEO, grew the revenue um, $80 billion uh, a year, in fact, becoming the most, uh, third most profitable company in the United States, retired in 2014, had a little time on his hands, so he went out and bought himself a basketball team, which he's been having a lot of fun with. Um, if you ever Google Balmer Dunk, I, or Bing, I'm sorry, Bing, you Google uh, Dunk, uh, <laughs> you should uh, do that at some point. You'll see how much fun he's been having uh, with the Clippers. He, by the way, the NBA draft was last night, and so he actually came in uh, uh, quite early today. Uh, to, to make this. And with his wife, Connie, he's co-founded the Balmer Group, um, including the USA Facts, uh, which he'll talk about in terms of uh, developing transparency about government data. He'll be uh, interviewed by Andrew Sewer, who is the editor-in-chief of Yahoo Finance, previously the managing uh, editor of Fortune. He'll ask Steve some questions. During that time, you can be writing down questions on your own index cards and so forth, and we'll collect those and uh, hand those to Andy. Um, so at that point, kind of more of a free form, we'll make sure to get your questions in while Andy's asking uh, some questions as well. So please join me in welcoming uh, Steve Ballmer. Well, thanks. It is a privilege to have a chance to chat with you today. Um, I still sort of like pinch myself and say, what's a, a former CEO uh, turned basketball junkie uh, doing in front of a bunch of policymakers and not talking about technology? Uh, but um, I'll share some thoughts with you and hopefully uh, pique some of your, your interest. Uh, when I, when I retired from Microsoft in 2014, my wife grabbed me in immediately and said, okay, man, it's time. You've got to help me now with our philanthropic stuff. She had been focused on foster care issues, largely in Washington State where we live, and she said, it's time to ramp up. You know, we've been blessed with a lot, and it's time to make a difference. And we kind of knew, or she kind of knew, the focus for us would be on kids who are born into disadvantaged circumstances where their probability of moving up economically was low. You could say they're kids who were born without the American dream. And my response to my wife was, don't worry about it. Government takes care of this problem. Government puts money up for um, all of these programs. There's really not much for philanthropy to do because in the grand scale of the amount of money that gets spent, philanthropy is just a, a drop in the bucket. So let's happily pay our taxes and feel good about it and make our contribution. To which she said, what? Come on, we can do better than that. Come on, are you nuts? And so I said, oh, OK, uh, I'll, I'll do it. But secretly, in the back of my mind, I still said to myself, Government really does all this stuff. Government pays for it. Uh, I actually came to DC, and I, I was kind of trying to learn outside the Microsoft context, and I uh, had a chance to sit down with a number of legislators, and I sat down with two senators from the same state, and I made my bold assertion about no reason to do philanthropy, give to government, and they looked at me, and their eyes bugged big out of their heads, and they said, you want to give your money to the government? You can certainly do better than that. 
Uh, and at that point, I, I had actually two things in my mind. Number one, I really was going to get to the bottom of whether I was right about where government money goes. And number two, if we don't believe that our government's going to solve many problems, we have to understand why. And if it's something that can be addressed, let's really get after it and address it. So I said, OK, I've got to learn where these numbers come from. Where do they go? How much does government raise? Who do they raise it from? What do they spend it on? Does anything good happen? When I worked at Microsoft, we did this thing one time where we, we handed everybody a personalized benefit statement. This is what you got. The company's taking care of you. And I said, what would you send a citizen that explained to them uh, what, what their benefits are? Stalk the internet. Look for the data. And the truth is, there's more data out there, as many of you know, than there's ever been before. And it is more co incoherent than it's ever been before. Uh, you can find numbers isolated. It's the kind of thing I think politicians do. They don't really put things together in a coherent form. They'll grab a number that somebody mentioned to them, and they'll blurt it out as if it's the only important number going. I stopped, stepped back, and said, how would we want to attack this problem? And I said that, for me, the sensible way was to look at it through the same kind of Oops. The same. Where did I go there? Back, back. The same kind of lens that a business person would look at their business. Structured numbers, organized, a context, so that everybody in the company can understand those numbers, drive against them, measure, get uh, understanding and analysis. Uh, that meant a certain set of things to me, but at the end of the day, companies also have to report to external parties. They report through shareholder meetings, annual reports, and the granddaddy of them all, the 10K. The SEC drives these 10Ks. They have to be rigorous. They have to be absolutely correct, factual. They can show no bias. Your 10K can't say, well, we missed our, you know, we're going to do better next year. No, the SEC shuts that down. Just the facts. Just tell us the history. They have to be comprehensive. It's not like you can say, well, we're going to tell you about the part of the business that's going well, but we're going to skip other things. They have to be contextual. An SEC report contains history. It shows how all the numbers roll up into a, into a common place. And a 10K has to be comp, you know, comprehensive and contextual. So that was sort of the set of criteria that I, I started out with. Many of these things, and which to me meant we only use government numbers. We're not using forecasts. We're not using estimates. We're not using money or numbers that come from you know, this research institute. No, nah, a business has to use its own numbers. And government should use its own numbers. And government decision makers should work off government numbers. Otherwise, fire everybody and get the numbers right. It's impossible to do better than that. The toughest challenge is, what is the logical structure of government? Businesses have to organize themselves into lines of business. They're called segments. What are the lines of business of government? What is the mission of government? How do you think about that? After a while, it became clear to us, we just turned to the preamble of the Constitution. It lays out the mission of government. To establish justice and ensure domestic tranquility, to provide for the common defense, to promote the general welfare, and the last one I always have to remember, secure the blessing of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. That's the mission of government. Those are the logical pieces to government. And then in each of these areas, just like a business, you could say, what are the key subsegments? Well, justice. There's physical problems, crime and disaster. There's commercial problems, consumer and employee safeguards. And then children need to be protected, if you will, from their parents. And you can go through and see the four big segments and the things that we categorize. This is, to me, a logical view of government. It's not organized like departments, uh, cabinet departments. It's not organized like Senate or House committees. I will point out to you that all three of those things are organized differently. 
It is not organized by the categories in the budget. Uh, one that we had hoped for for a while was to organize by political platforms. The problem is the two parties have different ones and they change all the time. These segments have to be consistent. So this is where we went. We went to the Constitution. This is the way for us to organize and present these numbers. Here's a little video describing what we did. USA Facts is proud to present our latest 10K and annual report for government. A 10K is a document that publicly traded companies must file each year with the SEC. It gives an accurate, unembellished overview of their financial performance. We use this same format for government in the U.S. to give a factual, unbiased, historical, and contextual view of the state of our country. Each line item is available in up to three formats. First, let's explore the interactive report for properties. Here, we can see how much land the federal government owns, which agency manages it, and how it breaks down by state. Down here, in map view, we can instantly visualize the data. Acres currently owned are here. Changes in acres owned, here. Second, let's explore the PDF report for management, analysis, and discussion. Here we are. Expenditures by segment. We can see total spending, and federal, state, and local spending, how it's changed, and how it tracks to the core missions of the U.S. Constitution. Third, embedded in these reports is this <coughs> interactive analysis. In this one, we can compare and contrast the latest data across multiple years, adjust for inflation and population, and more. Equally informative is this year's annual report. It's a simplified, more visual version of the information described in the 10K, shown through hundreds of vibrant charts and graphs. Let's glance at a few of the data sets, like where the government's revenue comes from, trends in crime, and what the average family earns and pays in taxes each year. Most of these figures are dynamic, meaning one click, and they link back to the respective source on the USA Facts website. The USA Facts Annual Report. The USA Facts 10K Report. Explore our nation in numbers. Just to give you a, a small sense, you can go to www.usafacts.org uh, if you want to get the report and take a look. Uh, I actually, I'm proud enough of the work that I'd recommend that you do it uh, because it is really a comprehensive look at government uh, by the numbers. Let me give you just a, some context. All of this is up on the site, but some things that are interesting. Top level presentation. Where does government revenue come from and where does it get spent? How big is corporate, you can see tax revenue, non-tax revenue. Before I started this, I didn't actually realize that non-tax revenue is as big as it is. A lot of that is gains on the portfolios of state and local government. And this does not include fees, the way the government does its accounting. Uh, revenue, for example, taken in to visit a national park is offset by the cost of the national park and doesn't actually show in revenue. Okay, interesting learning. Uh, these go down multiple layers, but I'll pick one, corporate income tax. With the last tax overhaul, a lot is made of corporate income tax, and certainly everybody can decide whether it's big or small, but at least as a percentage, if you go up, it's the third thing from the top on the far left, it is a smaller percentage of the total than at least I had in mind when I started. I would have said corporate income taxes are bigger. The other thing which we do when you get to the analysis by individual is you recognize that corporate entities don't really pay taxes for themselves. They pay taxes on behalf of their shareholders. So in a sense, that is a tax by and large on pension funds and people's pensions, as well as the most affluent people uh, in the country. Similarly on expenses, you can see how we're organized by segment and then the detailed spending below. We treat both Social Security and Medicare as savings programs, because that's really what they both are. You put money in, you take money back out. One's like a health savings account. 
the others simply like a, a place to, like a regular savings account. So we put those under the topic of securing the ble these blessings for ourselves and our liberty, just to give you uh, an example. A couple things that uh, are surprising. I think when I went into this, I probably expected government to be mostly, not mostly, but a lot of bureaucrats. You know, if you would read the popular press or listen to the blah, 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 blah of many people, what you would conclude is government's full of bureaucrats. You take a look at this, there's over 23 million people employed by government in the U.S. What's the biggest block at the top at almost half? Teachers and other people who work in schools. That would include universities as well as K through 12. Health and hospitals. These are public health inspectors. These are people who work in government hospitals. How many people get treated in government hospitals? I do. I go to the University of Washington Hospital. Everybody who works there is actually a government worker. You can keep going. General government and other. That's finance and administration in addition to some bureaucrats. But if you take a look at 1.6 million divided by 23 million, you get about 6.5%, call it 7% uh, in overhead and bureaucrats. Most companies run 4 or 5%. Not, not significantly different than you would find in most companies. Active duty military, not bureaucrats. Police, not bureaucrats. Highway and transportation, not bureaucrats. Corrections, not bureaucrats. Uh, natural, re uh, sorry, national defense, not bureaucrats. And you keep going down the list from the top, and the first thing I concluded is, wow, the shape of government employment is quite different. I think the federal government, counting the military, is about four million of this. Uh, and I think uh, uh, military, active duty plus civilian, is half of the federal number, just to give you a sense of, of size and scale. GDP, a lot gets talked about. Uh, I watch CNBC. Uh, I'm one of those folks who has it on when I'm on the elliptical machine in the morning. Uh, and you say, boy, these people love to talk about GDP. Understanding GDP turns out to take a little bit of time, just, just a couple minutes. As a business person, I don't want to hear economic analysis, yik, 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 too complicated for me, too subject to, to uh, what shall I say, partisan, partisan views. We're completely nonpartisan. After all, adjectives are partisan. Numbers are just what they are. They're not. In a world of fake news and alternate facts, numbers are numbers. They come from government. They're about the history. They speak for themselves. Back to GDP. How do you make GDP grow? Well, a business would do cost accounting on something like this. It is a number of units times dollar per unit. GDP is GDP per person growth times inflation. That would be you know sort of future dollars compared to existing dollars times number of people. OK, the productivity measure in there, the secret sauce of innovation in America, what's happened to GDP per person growth? Well, it was going up like this, accelerating growth in GDP per person. And now that has at least as Excel, God, these things keep flipping. Yeah, trended change in red. You can see that the GDP per person growth is actually sloping down. So when a politician gets up and says, yes, we're going to do everything with GDP growth, which you tend to hear, frankly, from both parties in their own context, it's a little hard to believe. That means there's two ways to grow GDP. Inflation, I think most people say, oh, inflation, bad. We don't want to become a banana republic. So that leaves you with population growth. Population growth in the United States is about 2 million people a year. Half of population growth comes from the fact that births exceed deaths. Half comes from immigration. So if you want GDP to grow, those are your variables. You can drive up inflation. You can drive up productivity, which has not been at an accelerating pace. 
or you can drive up population, which is primarily an immigration matter. And of course, paying the national debt and our future obligations depends heavily on growth in GDP. You can do the thinking, everybody can have a different analysis of this, but this is kind of what, what the numbers say. And we're at a record percentage of the working age population that's working. What does all this mean? I'm not trying to give a tutorial on this particular topic. It's the kind of thing that if you look at it through the numbers, as opposed to the principles, you can just say to yourself, do I believe, as a regular old person, not an economist, what do I believe about what might happen with GDP? And our goal is to make these numbers understandable enough for, those, for that purpose. Not to tell you what's going to happen, but to let you assess. My wife and I used this chart. Remember where I told you, I said government solves all the questions of poverty and opportunity. My wife said, no, it doesn't. Well, the truth we've learned through our philanthropy is government does provide most of the money. And philanthropy and community partnership actually steers the money. If you look at that, there's about $1.3 trillion of money that gets allocated to support poor kids and their families. 1.3 trill out of a total government budget of 5.7 trillion dollars. And if you take out Social Security and Medicare, it's quite, I think it's off the top of my head, I remember 33 or 40 percent. We don't make a, neg a negligible investment in kids who need opportunity. This is another usage point. Ah, we have the data. How does that Medicaid money get used? And now the question is, how do we get the numbers that let people dive into this? A lot is made of family income, the hollowing out of the middle class. I did not understand when people said the hollowing out of the middle class, I still not sure I understand what the word middle class means. But the numbers do allow us to do some analysis. What we have here is, is three rows. One for the poorest 20% of people in the country, one that's for the middle 20%, and one that is for the top 20%. We have total, in, uh, it's a busy slide, much of interest, but we took it right, right as a concept from the report. You can go over to total income. Let's go to the middle, and you can look at the blue and the red. Blue is from 2000, red's from today, okay? Make sense? 60, it took, at that time, it took $67,000, no, sorry, it took $38,000 to get into the middle 20%. That shocked me by itself. 60% of, 40% uh, of the people are under $38,000 a year of income. But when you progress through to 2016, it only takes $33,000 to get into the middle 20%. It is true, the middle income is shrinking. This is all inflation adjusted. It is shrinking. Ah, now I understand what the hollowing out of the middle class means by the numbers. I understand that. I can explain it, not just as a bunch of blah, 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 and then Feldstein says this, and then somebody else says that. The numbers, at least in my own case, and anybody who barely likes numbers, the numbers can set you free. It's 38,000 goes to 31, sorry, yeah, 38,000 goes to 31,000. That's what it takes now to be in the middle class. Education. Education spending is up dramatically, dramatically. Over the course of 1998 to today, education spending per kid, inflation adjusted, is up from 10,000 to 12,000 dollars. You take a look at the high school graduation rate, it's up. <clears throat> Sounds good. We have more teachers per student. That's why the education spend is up. Most people think student-teacher ratios are going the wrong way. They're going the right way from a lot of people's perspective. And yet, with all of that spending and with all that improved graduation rate, the <coughs> increase in reading and math proficiency for eighth graders is largely flat and it's largely flat around 33%. Only 33% of eighth graders are proficient in math and reading, and yet we're graduating now, what is it, 
82% and spending a ton more on education. Everybody can draw their own judgment. Is it good that we're spending more? Is it bad? Is it getting us the outcomes we want? This is what it looks like, if you will, by the numbers. Crime. Uh, with our focus on kids looking for opportunity, one thing you'll find is a lot of poor kids grow up in families in which people are incarcerated. What's the profile? How does that look? We can show you here incarceration rates, which rose and are now falling. Arrest rate for drug abuse is probably the primary, is the primary driver of the fall. So with drug reform, you can decide whether you're for or against drug reform, we will see some decline. Now, I'll remind you, the surge in drug arrests came with the crack, crack epidemic, and we are now facing an opioid epidemic. What will people feel about drug arrests and drug crime with the rise in opioids? Will people want to use mental health solutions? Will we invest? All good questions. But let's make those judgments in the perspective of the numbers. One thing we get hit on a lot is too many people are incarcerated. Well, part of that is drug crime, but part of that actually is violent crime. What is the average number of months that a violent criminal serves in prison? Violent crime is rape, murder, aggravated assault, uh, manslaughter, robbery, armed robbery. Okay, those are the five things. Five things that are violent crime. Well, the average violent criminal who doesn't die in prison, because there'll be some who die, serves 4.2 years, 50 months. I looked at that and said, whoa, that surprises me. That's an average of people who beat you up, people who rob you at gunpoint, people who kill you, and people who, who rape women. 4.2 years? I was surprised. If society decided we had to incarcerate violent felons for a longer period of time, of course, the incarceration rate would again increase. I make no judgment because USA <coughs> Facts is not a partisan organization, but I think people can make judgments and see how they feel about these topics. I'll show you one more. This is uh, work that an economist named Raj Chetty has done but it's just a representation of government numbers. <clears throat> he has a proprietary access to tax records because he's under contract with the IRS, and he mixes and matches those with census records, and then does an analysis. What percentage of kids born in the bottom 20%, for example, wind up in the bottom, the middle, uh, the top, et cetera? You can see you get about three times as many kids in the bottom staying in the bottom as moved to the top. That's white kids. If you look at the same number for black kids, it's over 10 times as many stay in the bottom 20% versus move up. Now, in our own case, on this issue, I am partisan. I don't think that's okay. I don't think the percent, I think the percentage of kids who move up in a community should be higher. Otherwise, the American dream just dissipates. So for me, this makes a dramatic statement in terms of how I think about other things that I, I do in my life. Again, the numbers in this case set us free. Now, what we figured out, my wife and I, I'll footnote this for you since I have a minute, is philanthropy does have a role. Government funds programs. Government doesn't take accountability for solutions. A kid in school who's not performing, is the problem the school? To some degree. But to an even bigger degree, it may be issues in the community which make it impossible for that kid to get anything done. And so, again, the numbers will serve to set us free, but then philanthropy has to fill in around the edges for the things that government programs don't fund and to stitch things together across communities. So for all of the reasons I got started working with my wife, I now am back full circle on both parts. She's right, philanthropy matters, and I'm right, government mostly pays for these things. 
I hope some of this made some sense and wet your whistle. We certainly have a lot of work to do. <clears throat> if you go to our site and do a search, search doesn't work as well as it needs to, because searching these things is a complicated issue. We work with our partners at Wharton on the back end. We're all hard at work on what does it mean to make search work better. Government data is not always timely or accessible, or frankly, it doesn't always agree with itself. If you look at state and local spending, the way the states report it versus the way the federal government reports, whoops, doesn't match. Now, I don't think anybody's doing the, a bad job. I think everybody's trying to do their best. But there's not enough pressure in the system, despite the Data Act, to put these things together. How does anybody make a decision with data which sometimes doesn't reconcile and isn't out on a timely basis? State and local data is much messier than any data that's collected by the federal government. Much messier. We are hell-bent and determined to provide state and local data, but it is very, very difficult. We're working on that. And ultimately, what we would hope to do is have a body of data that people can use in decision making. In my dream of dreams, we'll be out of business in 10 years. In my dream of dream, government will produce its own 10K, an annual report. In my dream of dreams, every legislator someday will have to sign, just like a CEO does, that they've read the numbers and that they're accurate. Every legislator and executive, uh, elected executive branch official will have to sign and say, yes, I believe in these numbers. And then people can't bicker about what happened. You can bicker about what you want to do about it, but do not bicker and do not bring your own numbers. I think it was Moynihan who said, you know, we can all uh, disagree about what to do, but we shouldn't disagree about what the facts are. The facts are the facts. And what we're trying to do is in the most uh, sort of, if you will, neutral way through numbers to explain where the country is and bring them together. Ultimately, government should do that job for itself. Every stack of government data is its, in its own silo. I love the Bureau of Labor Statistics. I love the census. I love what Treasury does. I love what, what all of these agencies does. Can we get one group in government that's actually chartered with bringing the numbers together in a coherent form? I hope so. Uh, in the meantime, we'll keep slogging away and hopefully give you a resource that you can use as you do your jobs uh, and as the people that you work for go forward on their work. Thank you very much. And as Andy and I do some Q&A, we'll look forward to that. It's been a pleasure. Uh, and if you promise not to give it out, I'd be also happy after the fact to entertain questions or suggestions, Steve B. at BalmerGroup.com. Thanks very much. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Um, while we get these chairs moved over here, we can do it ourselves. You know, they talk about. No, I got it. You got I got this one. Okay. Excuse us. Andy says we can do it, yes. and then he does, and I, I don't. I, I, well, you, know, you got to take it away from me. Anyway, uh, Steve, thank you very much for that uh, uh, highly uh, informative, interesting, and not surprisingly energetic uh, presentation. It's really pretty incredible uh, what you're doing, I think, and, and it's very singular. You know, as you were saying, you know, when you were talking about how you came up with the idea with your wife, and you think about all the things that people in your position are doing. I mean, I can't think of anybody who's doing anything even remotely like what you're doing. So kudos to you for that. Thank it's you very, very interesting. much. Yeah. I, I guess, um, so, so what's going to happen here is Kent said, I'm going to ask some questions. We've got some questions from the audience. And you guys can continue to think up questions. I think there are going to be people coming around if anything occurs to you uh, while we're talking. We're going to talk about USA Facts. I may ask a question or two about basketball, maybe a question or two about the tech sector, but mostly we'll talk about what's going on here today. Um, just to start off, Steve, you talked a lot about the genesis of this idea, but I just want to clarify a little bit more. What problem are you really trying to solve here? Is it that individuals don't understand the, their government, or it's that 
regulators and lawmakers need to get a better grip on things, or is it both? I would say I would not, well, in a way you could say I started this project as a hobby. And when we first uh, launched our first product two years ago, I had no clue whether anybody would really be interested. And I was surprised. Prob I mean, we got a little extra boost from, you know, fake news and alternate facts, I will say. Uh, it was a good environment for this product to launch. And I said, okay, we're going to really take this on and be serious. Uh, I worked at Microsoft. Microsoft builds products for the masses. I didn't want to build a product that was only going to be used by a small group of, of, if you will, specialists. So we're building a product that should be rich enough to support people who want to be in great depth, but we can put that information together in a way that brings these things alive to what I would call at least the percentage of citizenry that wants to be informed, that's not everybody, um, and is, you know, if not comfortable with numbers, at least comfortable with graphs. One of the toughest things actually we have is people who are not comfortable with big numbers. You say a million to most people, they say big number. You say a billion, they say big number. If you remind them that a trillion is a thousand billions, and that a trillion is a million millions, oh, what does that mean? The numbers are too big to comprehend. So we will work on issues like that to make this accessible to the in citizenry that wants to get informed. And yet the database, the thing we're building with Wharton and the tools, they'll be rich enough to do essentially any level of analysis that folks in this room might want to do. One of the big conundrums uh, in the media today, being a media person, is, is getting it out there. You know, in space, no one can hear you scream. You've got this great set of data. You've got usafacts.org. How do you get the word out? Do you, how do you push the, the message, the information, the media out to people? I think we have been modestly successful so far, and most of it's been stimulated, frankly, by the fact that people are a little curious about why I did this thing, and so you get a little bit of a bootstrap. That's not going to be enough, and we're hard at work. We actually just today announced that we've hired Poppy McDonald, who was uh, president and COO of Politico, is going to come join us uh, to, to work both on developing the product and helping put it in a form that will reach more and more people. Where are you located, and how many people work at this endeavor? Uh, we are in our offices in just outside Seattle, Washington. Mm -hmm. And it turns out you could be almost anywhere. Right. The numbers are in the Internet, so it doesn't mean you have to be in D.C. Or, we do not ask government for their help with anything. Why would we? We only want to use publicly available data. Although I will say I had a real charge out of meeting the controller general, numbers lovers over there at GAO, and I got a chance to speak at the National Association of State and Local Government Auditors. That was a great fun thing for at least me. It might not be everybody's cup of tea, but um, where was I going? I lost. I lost my thread. Well, just the people working there. Oh, so how many people yeah. do we have working? We have. Four full time. We have a number of contractors who actually wrote the 10K, produced the annual report. That's probably another four or five contractors. We have a, a decent sized team at, at Wharton, which does a lot of the work, and then another decent sized team that we contract for the web design. This is not something that would, if the government want to do it, we're not talking about another 5,000 people to pull this kind of stuff together. And without getting into the budget necessarily, I don't know if you want to reveal that, but it doesn't sound like it's something that's draining your, your personal coffers particularly. I mean, it's something you're funding on an ongoing basis. Yeah, I fund it all myself. We don't try to make revenue. That might have bias. Um, so we don't do that. Uh, we're running now single-digit millions a year, and I, we know we're going to need to increase that budget, but um, I don't think... You, and I've been fortunate enough, we can fund it. It's a lot of money, but 
again, if you do a thousand millions of billion, uh, it's not. Anyway, let me right. leave it there. It is okay. fundable and affordable by me. Right. Um, I want to talk about uh, about this notion of bias because that's really interesting to me because it's just. And you mentioned also, you know, that this era that we're living in with fake news and what's true and all that. It's just. It's very hard to be unbiased, Steve, right? And inevitably, don't things become political? I, mean, you were, I remember at one point I was looking at, he was talking about foreign aid, and foreign aid, as it turns out, is a really small number compared to the overall budget. But if you had a political lens on it, you could still say, but that's still a lot of money. So, so how do you avoid that political bias? Well, that's OK. People are allowed to have their opinion. The only thing you don't want to do is take it out of context. You want to hold people accountable. You say, okay, I can't remember off the top of my head. Let's say that number is about 40 billion. Okay, 40 billion out of 5.7 uh, trillion. That is what it is. And you could say, hey, look, we should go get a couple billion out of there. We should leave it alone. But you might want to drill in and take a look that almost 40% of foreign aid is actually spent helping military allies and partners. It goes into Afghanistan. It goes into Iraq. You take a look at that and say, oh, that's not what I think about as foreign aid. But I'm, Israel is one of the biggest beneficiaries of this country when it comes to foreign aid. Surprised me, I will say. So you take a look at all that and say, how much is really going to support countries in, for example, sub-Saharan Africa, which is where I think most people think our foreign aid budget would go in large measure. Now you're down to a number that is several single digits of billions. And you can decide whether that's too much or too little. Uh, I mean, it's a rounding error in the defense budget, for example. Right. And I just saw a number of things up there that you know could be seized upon by politicians that one where more people are working and you know you could see someone on either side of the aisle going see or or not and then someone trying to debunk that but that you know you have to acknowledge that that a fact is a fact the Daniel Patrick Moynihan thing right yeah I mean it is it's 69 percent of people of working age are actually working you could say oh well we're gonna get to 75 or 80 well 69 is the highest it's ever been or you could say one of the big boons that drove that is the higher number of women who are now in the workforce. And everybody can have a different perspective on what's right or wrong. But if somebody said to me, 69 is going to go to 80, if somebody made that yeah. assertion to me and I looked at the trend line, I'd fall out of my chair laughing. Yeah. I mean, that number surprised me. And then it runs counter to this whole thing of this you know, huge uh, unemployed class of people that we have that you keep hearing about, right? Unemployment's also, it turns out it's a very synthetic number. It's an estimate, which is why uh, labor participation rate is an actual. I'll give you another one of my favorite. You know how we talk about life expectancy? Life expectancy is actually a forecast. The average age at which people die, that's an actual. Turns out the average age at which people die is about 72 point whatever, four or five years. Uh, maybe it's 73.5 now, and it's only in the last 15 years it's come up from 72.5. The benefit in terms of average age of death for the dramatic increase in health care spend is not very much, particularly if you do the isolation of smoking as a numerical factor. And somebody could decide, hey, look, it's my loved one, let's spend all the money. I, I certainly would do that for my loved ones. But again, the numbers are interesting, but they don't tell you what to think. They do let you call, call somebody out for misrepresenting the situation. I love how you have all those numbers at your disposal. I mean, it's, it's, it seems like it's a real passion of yours, right? I mean, you really, he's good. By the way, I think you got an 800 on your math SAT. Or Actually, no, I got no? a 790. Wikipedia's oh. wrong on Is that, that. right? See, to be fair. Yeah, this is a problem with Wikipedia. That says, uh, that's actually But I want to establish my real street uh -huh. cred on this. Uh -huh. I went to a math camp one summer. Oh, yeah. You don't find a lot of math campers standing around. Yeah, yeah. Great stuff. Why don't we go to some questions, because I'm starting to, they're starting to build up here uh, from the audience. And this one is actually one that I had, which is, do you see a government office or agency capable of executing your plan? Or should one be created? Or, to follow up on this question, why don't they just turn over the whole damn thing to you? 
I mean, the census, for instance, why don't you do it? Yeah, no, I think we'll pass on that. Uh, for a lot of reasons, you want people to know that stuff is of highest integrity. And if people don't think government produces things of the highest integrity, including whoever the leaders themselves are, then damn it, fix it. If you're a business and your numbers aren't good, you have to fix it. So, no, we would never, uh, you know, we would never choose uh, to produce those numbers uh, ourselves. Where could government choose to do that work? Uh, certainly, if they were chartered, uh, you could do it in the, in the GAO. GAO now ha doesn't have a reporting function it, primarily, although they do reporting. They're primarily oriented towards audit on behalf of the, uh, uh, the legislature. Uh, you could say, let's do it in OMB, but o OMB has huge turnover and has a fu fundamental political appointee. The GAO thing is beautiful, by the way. This controller general post, it amazed me when I learned about it. How does it, it's a 10 year term. The next controller general will be proposed by both houses of Congress and you will have Democrats and Republicans recommend a candidate, two or three of them, to the president. The president picks one. The term is 10 years. And the only way you can throw a controller general out of office is same impeachment process mm. as the president. Now, if you want integrity in numbers, that's a way to do it. You remove the number gathering and publication process from the political process and you give people the time, like a 10-year horizon, to do that job well, you do it in a bipartisan way, you know, people say the Census Bureau is going to cook the numbers or they're not, and for the next, that's terrible. It is terrible that that can be a discussion, uh, a political discussion. And I think those kinds of things should be isolated from the political process through something much akin to what goes on at GAO today. All right, here's another one from uh, the audience, Steve. Do you see the current budget cuts reducing the quality of government data? The quality of government data uh, is, to me, a lot about timeliness and double-checking numbers across agencies. There's nobody chartered right now with assembling the numbers and checking things against each other. And there apparently is no pressure from the Congress to get numbers on a timely basis. So, unless you're going to get after those issues, I think you're in a non-starter. Now you could say, hey, look, you know, do we need more resources in the Census Bureau or not? I don't know. I, I mean, this is just like working at Microsoft. More money in a function doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get better work. Maybe you need more automation. Maybe you need fewer people and more automation. Maybe you'd get a better result. I certainly found that. So I'm not arguing one way or the other, but I think the general prevailing sentiment that says, if we just had more, our numbers would be better, I, I don't buy that. I, I don't think that's necessarily the case. Okay. Does USA Facts explicitly consider the impact of law legislation Example, cost of Obamacare. If yes, then how? Okay, how much do we really know about the cost of the ACA? To use a less political uh, right. word. Yes. What do we really know about the cost of the ACA? Not really that very much. The numbers aren't timely enough to really have a lot of good data for decision making. I can't remember, maybe we've got one year of numbers, maybe two, that the government has rolled up and consolidated and are in an analyzable form? You know, can you really now model what's happened to emergency room visits? What's happened to, uh, um, uh, what do they call it? Free care at hospitals. How have all these things moved? The truth of the matter is the numbers are not timely enough to do a good analysis. Would we publish that as an integrated Analysis, if the numbers were timely, the answer is yes. The immigration data, we, we have a, a new part of the site up that gives you the history of immigration going back many decades. How did policy changes? How did population change? How did immigration change? 
But is that really going to look at the last year or two? No. The last year, it's just not current. The government numbers need to be more current. And I think in that case, you can argue that the answer has got to be automation. It just mm -hmm. can't be more human beings. Right. That doesn't sound like it's necessarily going to happen over the next six months, does it? No. These are decisions that will be made with old data. On the other hand, there are interesting facts. The U.S. population grows by about 2 million people a year. Half, I think I said this, half are from immigration, half are from uh, births exceeding deaths. Interesting fact. Yeah. I think off the top of my head about uh, 11, 12, 13 percent of the U.S. population is foreign born. That's been consistent pretty much for decades. That number is not dramatically up or down. Undoc the movement of undoc uh, sorry, border apprehensions are dramatically down. Border patrol agents are dramatically up. Is one the cause of the other? Who knows? Maybe, maybe not. But you can at least look at a bunch of data and say, hmm, does the current debate, is it well grounded in the numbers? Where do most immigrants come from? Family members of existing uh, 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 people living yeah. in, well, not citizens necessarily, could but be on, living on in a the proper States, visa. Right. But right. Uh, then, you know, certainly you can hear that argued in the press. Uh, it's a bad thing, and then you get terms that are pejorative, or it's a good thing, and then you get terms that are not. But at least people should understand the perspective there. This is a good one. Are there government numbers you don't trust? Are you concerned that at some point in the future there will be government numbers you don't trust? I trust that we have high integrity, honest people doing their best work. I don't trust that the government is well uh, structured to put those things together in a professional way. I hope the Data Act eventually goes farther, for example. I think there ought to be an agency that is required, or part of some agency, to put the numbers together and make sure they tick and tie. Even businesses, if they're not careful, will get numbers that, don't, that come from different sources and don't match each other. So I believe we have a high integrity government that is, of people in our government that's doing a good job. I believe the process is not well organized and well structured. Uh, I think that's more of a management challenge than anything else. Uh, I worry, as I said earlier, about the timeliness of the data. Do I worry about whether politicians will muck with the data, which was kind of part of it? I guess I, I don't worry about that really being today's problem. But as I said, I prefer the, the uh, structure of GAO because then I think you can tell the population, no, no politicians cooking the books. And number two, then you'd have a professional organization, well-managed, that can take a long-term perspective on the numbers. And so you say you don't work with the government at all? No. I mean, uh, we, we reached out, I mean, we have reached out to some people in government. It turns out it's really hard to get some of the state and local stuff. So we had some interns from Stanford last summer poking around the internet to try to find, and they found actually some telephone numbers. And sometimes if you call the right person, the data exists, and you can get the data. And so it's not that it's not publicly available, it's just impossible to find. In fact, we, one of our interns called State Capitol in Olympia, Washington, and they said, yeah, you can have the data. Great, how do I get it? Well, you have to come into our offices physically, look at the data, and then leave. What the heck? Is this the year 2018 in the state that's the headquarters to Microsoft and Amazon? Woo! Uh, pretty nutty in my, in my perspective. All right, someone seems to be taking issue with something. This is a kind of a real-time question, okay? You seem to be, Steve, a little naive. There is no evidence that BLS, Census, BEA, et cetera, are subject to any political influence similar to GAO. You shouldn't imply otherwise. It's more of a statement than a question, but just 
thought I'd tell you. What I tried to be careful said. about that, and if I wasn't careful about that, I, I apologize. Mm -hmm. I said I believe in the integrity of the people who are doing the work. I said the management structure, these numbers do not tick and tie. They don't. If you look at numbers that come out of agencies, they don't match each other. Believe me, there's a nice man here called Richard Coffin who'll be happy to tell you about all the numbers that don't match. And I believe people are working with integrity. Does the American population believe people are working with integrity? Absolutely not. Otherwise, we wouldn't be having this debate about people trying to cook the census. Therefore, I would say having something that by appearance is better from an integrity perspective would be a good thing. But if, if people think I cast aspersions on the people at BEA or BLS, I apologize to anybody who's here. I think these are wonderful people doing, as they say, God's work. Uh, and believe me, there's no USA facts without great work at those agencies. I hope that satisfies that comment that that person made. Um, how do you decide on how much metadata or context to analysis uh, to provide with um, your numbers? Well, the metadata context and analysis are like three different things. Okay, so yeah, true. We, are, uh, we are trying to provide the metadata basically in better and better <laughs> forms, and that's something we work on. You need to have a taxonomy of the information. That's why we started out with these segments and cohorts of population, uh, but that's how you'll do the best job with metadata. There has to be some kind of description, and it can get more detailed or not. At some point, the metadata gets so complicated, nobody will understand it. In terms of, it was metadata analysis, and what was the Context, thing? I guess. Context. Yeah. Context is something where I'm proud of what we've done. We provide a lot of context. Now, are there places where I might sometimes want to see three pieces of information on the same piece of paper that we do not put on the same part of the website, you have to pull it together yourself? The answer is absolutely yes. But we give you the tools, if you don't think we have the context you want, to bring in more numbers that are contextual. Analysis we will only do in the following sense. We might take, at some point, sets of numbers and show you what they would look like in two or three or four different cases, we would not tell you that we predict this, we forecast this, we absolutely say this caused this. Uh, that is, that's beyond the scope of letting the numbers tell the story. That Then you have to sort of believe that we have better economists or better something than everybody else, which, which I would think just can't be the case. So I won't, we won't do that kind of analysis. Okay, a couple more and then I'm gonna switch over to some other topics like basketball and the, and the world of tech a yeah. little bit. Okay, uh, this person is kind of like from the home front here a little bit. Now that I have a small child at home, I've noticed that we all are really just little maximizers. We want our goodies and don't wanna pay for stuff. How does your tool help people understand not just what government does, but the constraints it faces and the trade-offs that are necessary? For example, what if I want higher teacher salaries and smaller class sizes? Okay, the numbers are actually there for you to, if you want to, run that scenario. I have run that very scenario. My wife loves to tell me teachers are highly underpaid, for example. So what do you do? First, you look at what is the average teacher pay? What percentage is teacher pay is total, uh, of total education is, is teacher pay? How much do teachers get paid beyond what's in their salaries? At Microsoft, I'll just tell you, benefits on an average uh, employee would be about 25% maybe all in of the person's salary. On teachers, that number's about 50%. How do you want to factor in the fact that benefits are, and you work nine months, how do you want to factor that in? People have to decide how to think about that, but we give you the numbers to increase and multiply. I think you have to use the fully burdened number as opposed to just, just the salary number. So you can do this. Let me, let me give you an example. I think the average teacher in the U.S. makes without benefits, I want to say that number is about $60,000, 55000 
right in there. And let's say you wanted to give every teacher a $20,000 pay increase, $20,000 or $10,000. It's got to be a meaningful number. This is sort of a silly discussion. $10,000 per teacher, if I remember right. There's about 3.5 million K through 12 teachers. That gets you to about, uh, what, three? 300? 330 billion. No, it must be more like, yeah. Well, I better, I better stop. My brain's a little soft from the red eye. But you, you, can do, you can do those numbers. You multiply them out. Right. Let's say class sizes, I think, over the last 25-ish years, uh, or sorry, student-teacher ratios have gone from about 16 to 12. If they were still 16 today, education spend would be about 30% less than it is. Education spends about uh, $700 billion. So we have invested in student-teacher ratio about $200 billion, and we still have the educational outcomes we have. You decide whether that's been a good thing. You decide whether putting more money in. Recently, my wife and I have been working, looking at early childhood education. That's kind of like adding a new grade or two. So you add a new grade or two, that's like 2 thirteenths of 700 billion. And it turns out, if you really want to do what they call pro, uh, quality pre-K, pre-K uh, uh, teachers get paid less than other teachers. You'd put them up to regular teacher salary and uh, class sizes are always smaller in pre-K than they would be in regular, you'd wind up adding, uh, if I did the math right, about $150 billion if you wanted to do universal pre-K, unless then you want to start only doing that by scholarshipping some people. Anyway, all the data is there to do this kind of analysis on the site and then assess whether you want to make the trade-off. Somebody's going to say, let's cut something else. Somebody else is going to say, increase the deficit. Now, on that issue, I will admit I am partisan. I'm a business person. I don't understand the concept of not balancing the budget. Um, I would say both parties seem to have a way to not balance it. One likes to cut taxes. One likes to increase expenses. That is a nonpartisan view. My own opinion is, frankly, I don't care whether we increase revenue, decrease expenses, or some combination. The democratic process should determine that, but I hope over time we manage to balance the budget. Fair enough. I didn't realize you took the red eye. You're looking pretty good, I've got to say. But I guess it makes sense given what you were doing last night, right, which is the NBA draft. We'll get to that in one second because I want to ask you about the tech sector, Microsoft just a little bit. Tech sector. For years, the tech sector was driving the economy, still driving the economy, but they could do no wrong. Now there appears to be a backlash against tech uh, for various reasons, privacy, hacking, et cetera, et cetera. How do you think this is going to play out, Steve? Well, I'm not trying to do a woe is me thing, but remember we got hit by an antitrust lawsuit at Microsoft by the DOJ. This government stuff should be, you know, it's, it's serious stuff. And knowing what I know now, I would have resolved the issues, whether I thought, you know, at the time I did not think we were in any way monopolist, my opinion. I thought that was a condemnation of our behavior. But if you ask me now, we w I think we should have figured out how to settle matters out earlier uh, than we did. I do not think it was helpful for our company, the path we took. I think the tech industry right now is, could well repeat that experience. I think fully accepting that things are not the way they need to be and going to work on those issues in a way that people believe you are serious about as opposed to the tech industry generally appearing arrogant, I, I understand that. I also think it's important that it be clear where and what kind of direction will come because there are issues which tech companies I mean, somebody's got to decide what's okay and what's not okay. I don't think that should be Congress. I do think it should probably, in general, be one of the regulatory agencies. They can dig in. They can understand this stuff. They can keep it out of the, the political realm, by and large. But when it comes to privacy, those are we used to go through this privacy on the browser. They are super complicated issues with deep technology. 
What do people mean? What do they want? How to think about it? You know, is there fake news on Facebook? Of course there is. I could go right now on Facebook and say there's a, an earthquake, Richter scale 7, in Washington, D.C. And should I be allowed to do that? Or should that be something that somehow Facebook has a, a way to control? I don't know. I get how Facebook could control advertising. I, I don't get how, how their value proposition, which people, the world does like. I don't understand how it works at all if you have no freedom of speech, even if you're saying things that are patently false uh, online. I mean, it gets towards yelling, fire in a crowded theater. You know, it's where does freedom of speech end? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah. That's a, a timeless question. Yeah. Right. Um, interesting perspective there. So let me ask you about Microsoft. You stepped down as CEO in 2014. Sachin Nadella has taken the reins um, and um, seems to be doing quite well. What's he done right? What's he doing right there at Microsoft? Uh, well, let's start with the fact that the stock price is up about a factor of three. Uh, and it's the largest shareholder in Microsoft. <laughs> I'm okay with that. Uh, let's start there. Uh, now, you know, look, I'm, I, I'm, a, I kind of understand enough to be dangerous, and that yet I'm four years out of date. I told Satya actually when he took over, don't listen to old CEOs after about a year. You get incredibly out of date. And I mean that about me, and I mean that about Bill. I just, you get out of date. It's just not the same. So I am out of date. What I would say uh, is I see some things that I think are good and some things that I feed back to Satya that, you know, I would, I would like to see the com company do differently. But I trust that he's making the right decisions. The thing that has certainly been most notable is while we had started the cloud stuff 10 plus years ago, uh, it seems to be really humming. Yeah. Now, are there things underneath there? I'm always, as a shareholder, wanting to crawl in, but I think you could say net, 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 doing a great job. On the consumer side of the business, Xbox doing well, some of the other areas, hey, maybe you could go, could go further. Uh, I've been interviewing uh, basketball players recently, these are basically young men between the age of 18 and 21. That's an old person to be interviewing in this job. And I'll tell you, you know, Microsoft, yeah, they've kind of heard of the company. <laughs> Xbox? <laughs> Everybody's an Xbox. Well, one kid actually told me, Xbox, nah, PlayStation's much better. Thank God most of the rest of the guys have Xboxes. It sort of warmed the cockles of my heart. Interesting, and you know the power of those consumer brands inside a big company and letting them run free like that. I mean, and my understanding is that's what they've done with LinkedIn so far is letting that's a Microsoft bought LinkedIn, letting that thing run. Those are tricky things. If you buy something and you just let it run free, you wonder where was the synergy that was supposed to drive the value that you promised shareholders, and yet if you don't let it run free and you just suck the life out of it. So I, I just I think those are all sort of. Uh, you have to decide where you are. And 35, 38 bucks, and the stock's 101 yesterday. Something like that. Something like that. Two and a half X. All right, let's move over and talk a little bit about the NBA. Big night last night for you as the owner of the Los Angeles Clippers. Uh, talk about uh, the draft. I hope people are interested in this. I know I am. So you've got to bear with us if you're not, because he's passionately interested in this. I am. What did you guys need? Who did you draft? How did it work out? Uh, well, I would say we let me, were, let, I'm sorry to interrupt. What is it, what is it like? The, uh, what I really want to know also is what is it uh, like for the, an owner the night of the draft? What do you do? Well, I, let me say, I've owned the team for four years. We've only had one first-round draft pick the whole time I've been there. And we certainly have not had a high uh, draft pick. And we had two last night. So I'm like a kid in the can. Whoa, we got to really get up to speed on this stuff. So I literally participated in interviews with probably 25 young men. Uh, you know, we have people who are far more expert than me than saying this guy can run, this guy can jump, this guy plays angles, blah, blah, blah. Uh, we have a great guy running our front office, and we have Jerry West, who some of you may have heard of, yeah. uh, basketball icon as an as a advisor. 
Uh, so, but I, I have my thing I care about. Are these guys who continuously improve? Are these guys who work hard? Are these guys of high integrity? You can, you know, in the sense that if they say they're going to do something, they're going to do it. Uh, the medical reports, you know, some of the medical reports on these guys are very, very scary in terms of their ability to keep playing. So, for me, just doing that part and meeting these young men was cool as heck. Just cool as heck, I have to say, just full stop, period. But then, you know, the machinations, who do you get, who's going to pick who higher, can you trade up, who did your guy get through to you, Woo! Uh, and we were delighted. Uh, then you call the young men, and yeah, you guys are clipper. You know, when we met these guys, and we've had dinner with these guys, and you know, oh, we're all pumped up. They're pumped up, which is kind of fun. We'll have a big dinner to welcome them on Sunday, press conference on Monday. And what do you draft for, at least in my opinion? A rookie who you draft, you can keep if you want to with your team for almost nine years. So you're not drafting for what you might need next season. You're drafting for the best player for the next nine years. Uh, you know, if people play exactly the same position, I don't know. But we drafted the two best available players who we happened to be very excited. Some guys had gone, but we took a point guard from Kentucky. I'll just give you an example about why I loved him. He didn't even start. He was the least heralded recruit at Kentucky until J January, he moved in the starting lineup and just got better, 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 better. Just like I want USA Facts data to get better, 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 better. Uh, we also took a kid who actually finished his junior year, which is a big deal, but he was an unheralded recruit when he came into Boston College. Again, pushed himself, pushed himself, pushed himself. So these, these, these guys who actually can push themselves and improve, I was excited we had two guys like that. Let me ask you a question about the league, uh, Steve. How is it that the NBA has managed to avoid the problems that the NFL has had, say, for instance, um, with uh, um, kneeling for the um, national anthem? I think we have great leadership at the NBA, um, for sure. I can't imagine uh, better leadership. I think on that one, we had clear rules. You know, I would have supported our guys. I would have been okay with whatever they wanted to do, but the rule was clear that you need to stand for the national anthem, and if you don't, there's, there's consequences, and our players all knew that. I think we had the benefit of the fact that the NFL had already gone. I think our players have better avenues to express themselves. You know, they don't wear helmets in our sport. When you wear a helmet, nobody sees you. To be a public figure is actually harder. You can be a public, you know, there was a, a statement made by LeBron James, Chris uh, Paul, Dwayne Wade, and I think Carmelo Anthony was the fourth one at the ESPY Awards a uh, year before last. And they got up and made a real political statement, which I thought was awesome about what's going on in terms of violence and the issues with, you know, police and community. And that's great. We support, you know, our players are adults. They have a right to an opinion and they have a right to participate in the political debate. If you wear a helmet, nobody's going to recognize you. I mean, I bet if you said most people in this room, how many football players would you recognize if they walked in the room? The answer would be a small number, and almost every one of them would be a quarterback. Just, just my guess. So. All right, we are out of time, um, uh, so we're going to have to uh, leave it on that note. Uh, but it's, what a great conversation, Steve. USA Facts, a little tech and a little basketball. Please join me in thanking Steve Ballmer. Thank you, guys. That's great. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, really I great. appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Ken, back to you. Thanks. Thanks to both of you. It was, it was terrific. And we're going to take a really quick break. Bathrooms are right, right out there, and we'll reconvene at 10.45. Uh,
I'm Kimberly Burrow, Managing Director of Legislation and Special Projects with the Penn Wharton Budget Model. And I'd like to introduce our next panel, which focuses on advances in public policymaking. Um, we'll start with Kent Smetters. He's the Bettner Chair Professor in the Department of Business and Economics and Public Policy at the Wharton School. He's also our Faculty Director. Um, Kent has had previous positions in government and served on advisory panels. He's widely published and awarded. Kent. And I'd also like to introduce Stephen Goss. He's the Chief Actuary of the U.S. Social Security Administration. He's been the Chief Actuary since 2001. He's been there since 1973. Um, and he's going to talk about the 20th Annual Report of the Board of Trustees of the Social Security Administration. And then I'd like to introduce Tom Bartholz. He is the Chief of Staff of the Joint Committee on Taxation. He has been um, with the JCT since 1987 and Chief of Staff since 2009. He has years of experience with um, all taxes of all sorts and is also widely publicized. I give it to Kent to start the session. Thank you. Oh, he have my notes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so thanks, Kent, brother. Um, so we're going to, I mean, oh, do I have a, there we go. Thank you. Yes. Yes. All right. Excellent. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, advances in public policy, making tools and so forth, in particular what we've been working on uh, at the Penn Wharton budget model. And really, the uh, very consistent with Steve's presentation. So I was asked during the break, what's the relationship with the USA Facts? In particular, we have a very shared database layer. Um, USA Facts is, is about history coming up to the present day, and we're about uh, projecting forward. But the, it really is the same uh, core mission. It's really to move uh, from ideology to a much more rational discussion. We're about analysis. We're not about, you know, uh, we don't advocate, we don't recommend legislation or anything like that. Whether we really bring it as an institution, as an academic organization, what we really bring is uh, some deep uh, theoretical modeling, um, data analytics, but also the software development process, which is very integral to, to what we do. And I want to point out, very, uh, e even though we produce a lot of numbers that the official scorekeepers uh, and government uh, people with me today uh, produce, we have a great respect for the, uh, uh, the scorekeepers. As, uh, scorekeepers, as Steve also pointed out, very tough job, and it is incredibly important, I think, to maintain their independence uh, versus approaching other countries where it's he heavily politicized. And I've, uh, my first job after my PhD was with CBO, great memories, uh, JCT right up the stairs, um, great memories. And they, uh, uh, the official scorekeepers have a lot of institutional knowledge as well. One of my own motivations, and it is very uh, similar to what Steve was also talking about, is where we're headed as a nation. In particular, it's a nonpartisan issue to say the debt projection is kind of is uh, increasing dr dramatically. In particular, we're going to hit 100% of GDP in terms of the debt held by the public by the mid-2020s, and it is uh, it has a really per uh, big impact on the analysis. So this uh, graph shows is what is the impact of debt on GDP, and this is not about policy change. This is just the path that we're currently on, and that is if the, the blue line is sometimes called a standard uh, static analysis, in this case looking at GNP, when we think about debt and international ownership of some of that debt, GNP is probably a little bit be better metric. And what we sh can show here is just on the current policy path, that if, in fact, uh, we allow for now debt effects, that is uh, what sometimes called dynamic effects, it includes the a Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, that is the, that more yellow line, debt has a, a tremendous impact. And in fact, uh, over time, almost we'll lose almost 20% of GDP just from the increase in debt on the current law. Um, and it's simply because debt competes with household saving and international capital flows, and it has a crowd out effect. Uh, and, uh, capital formation. Now, a lot of times people cherry pick evidence. They say, hey, Japan has carried high debt. Why can't we? Well, Japan also has a, a household saving rate 10 times 
that of the United States. As a national saving rate, it's actually quite high in Japan. Um, the, but the empirical evidence is very clear. Debt has very, very large nonlinear effects, um, and you don't see, see a big effects when it's a, a small amount of debt, but it's big effects over time. And this is where a lot of the conventional models that have been used in Washington developed you know, over the decades, very easy to run, um, often easy to run on an Excel spreadsheet, things like that, but they're not picking up a lot of, the, uh, of the, these nonlinear debt effects. I'll give you an example. There's obviously, you've heard of a universal basic income, been in the news, Hollywood actors making, a, making it very popular, where it hasn't caught on so much with economists, but it's been very much in the news. And the idea is that every, every family would get you know, basic income, regardless of their income. Um, and uh, one organization using a fairly standard Keynesian model suggested that a, a universal basic in income of $6,000 for every man, woman, and child would actually increase GDP through this purchasing power effect that is common in Keynesian models. Uh, when we did this exact same analysis, we found just the opposite effect. Instead of GDP going up in, in a decade by 7%, it went down by more than 7% simply because of these uh, big debt effects. And it, it, the debt effects tend to be very nonlinear in the sense that when, in fact, uh, you have a lot of debt to begin with, adding more debt is even more impactful on the economy in terms of reducing uh, 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 GDP. GDP. And by the way, this graph here, that's the good news. The good news is, is this graph because we actually some sense of cheat. At some point, the model doesn't solve. So we assume in 2040, the government gets its act together and stabilizes the debt GDP ratio um, wherever it happens to be at that point, sometimes known as the closure rule. Uh, heroic assumption, but if we did not do that, the economy would actually collapse. And it's such a big impact. So let's talk a little bit how we apply this to two issues. One's uh, tax and the other one is Social Security. Um, so in the case of tax analysis, this is a partial representation of our, of our, uh, of our platform, is that we start with households, um, sometimes called a micro-SIM, sometimes called static scoring. So these households are hundreds of thousands of different types of households um, by all sorts of different characteristics. They grow up, they get married, maybe divorce, they get uh, education, college, have kids, uh, educate their kids, retire, and so forth. And this interacts with a tax module. It's very integrated uh, with it, and it feeds directly into this dynamic model. And the, the model that we're using is what's called the, over, the overlapping generations model. It's really the, the workhorse model of modern public economics, and it really is the model that I believe because of its forward-looking aspect that is more realistic and much more consistent with the empirical evidence by both the IMF, uh, Reinhardt and Rogoff, and so forth, that large, debt of, large amounts of debts can have very big nonlinear effects uh, over time. And I'm very happy that JCT uses the OLG model as one of their uh, core models as well. And we continue to push the OLG model uh, o o to, to really make sure uh, that we can add a lot, lot of more uh, details. And by the way, on our website, you can go to our website, and under the simulations tab, in fact, there will be tablets in the in the atrium during lunch. Uh, things. And so what we do with our modeling is we actually spend about 20% time coding, 80% time validating. So we always validate. In particular, we create these functional forms. We go back in time. We compare census data against uh, our model prediction. All, we first do that uh, in order before we project forward. So in this case is uh, education. You can see the actual data, what the microSIM would have predicted, how, how it matches up, and then the microSIM goes off into the, into the future with disability. We, have, we do this with across dozens of different tests. These are just some examples of uh, family composition as well. That matters a lot as you move into the future. Uh, uh, wage income deciles for inequality, even marriage rates, uh, and many other variables. Um, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act um, is, of course, as you know, broken into uh, several components. One is the individual side, and certainly the new, new rate structure, um, the pass-through provisions really uh, are, 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 are 
were costly uh, aspects, and some of the pass-through deductions were not always well under, understood by kind of the media. It's, it's, we want to talk a little bit about that. And in this table, we compare our numbers with the Joint Committee on Taxation uh, uh, numbers, who are the official scorekeepers, uh, both over the next 10 years as well as going over a, a longer time period. Since we, we you, uh, match our census data to IRS data, we're able, uh, we uh, always want to give a longer-term aspect as, as well. And in, in particular, uh, the, in, it, it, uh, these slides will be online if you want to look at them, but it, they're also in a lot of our, our, our briefs that we've posted. The individual side has lots of different components. I won't go through in a lot of detail. The corporate side, um, obviously everybody's familiar with the rate change from 35% to 21%. I emphasize that the treatment of investment here as well. Um, it seems like a very small um, loss of revenue, and we'll come back to that in just a little bit. In the old days, that used to be a really costly item. Why is it so cheap um, here by both of our measures? Where we differ by $100 billion on it, but still, sometimes that's often you know, a trillion dollars or more. And then you have some uh, offsets going the opposite direction, like amortization and so forth. And the international system would take too long to, to talk about moving to, to territorial. In the aggregate, our, our numbers work are, in fact, uh, about $500 billion more in lost revenue um, than uh, the, the Joint Committee on Taxation. Some of this was uh, about uh, $100 billion or so is, is from various income shifting and reclassification, which they also take into account. And in particular, it, it, they are um, uh, it, the, the Tax Act, because of its expiring provisions as well, and other incentives, really has the incentive for you to shift the years of where, where your income officially gets reported, but also the type of income. Uh, as a uni university professor, I really should convince Penn to hire me off, not as a W-2, but as an independent contractor. Um, that's going to save a lot of money, and then I should divide myself up between a service company and a software manufacturer. That would do things as, as well for my tax bill. Um, but uh, there's quite a bit of kind of, uh, of reclassification. And this reclassification, by the way, is not just uh, some of it's W-2 to C-Corp or pass-through, um, but don't think of it always as uh, going from C-Corp to pass-through. In fact, we sh our recent analysis shows that a lot of it is actually going to go from pass-through to, to C-Corp. You can actually go onto our website. There's a kind of a calculator there that if you're a, a business, you can actually put in your details and see if you're better off as a C-Corp or as a pass-through. And then we add dynamic effects. That was the static elements. It goes into our dynamic model. There's a big debate in DC how you mishmash uh, kind of short run models with long run models. Uh, and in this case, uh, we're able to have both uh, these Keynesian effects in the short run uh, along with a longer uh, run effects. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time. This is more of a debate in Washington and our amongst tax uh, folks about this, how you, uh, this low R versus high R, and in particular how you calibrate the model initially. But generally speaking, we get a, a, a bump in GDP in the short run and then um, uh, GDP doesn't increase substantially uh, very much. Most of it's driven by capital services. So it looks like you get this Keynesian effects in the short run as well as uh, uh, capital effects. And then federal tax revenues as well known. Uh, the, the system loses a lot in, uh, in revenue, but eventually from dynamic effects, uh, things eventually uh, recover. But in the meanwhile, you've uh, lost a lot of in revenue. So regardless of your assumptions, though, uh, whether you use a more favorable assumption for tax reform, which is uh, this initial uh, high return to capital versus a low return to capital, it's a theoretical debate in, in these models. Um, the key about this is that the, on an annualized basis, uh, the, what we predict is that the, that the Tax Act will lead to uh, annualized increase of growth of only about 0.06% per year to maybe 0.12% per year, which is, uh, and it actually goes down over time because of debt effects. And why, and this is much below the 0.4% that was very commonly discussed in Washington. As there was a common belief in Washington Washington, if we could just get growth increase by 0.4% a year, this tax reform would actually pay for itself. By the way, that number was actually never 
correct. And the reason why, they came from a CBO study. The CBO study was itself fine, but the CBO study wasn't about tax reform. It was on the current, on the pre-reform tax base, a, a rule of thumb. But when you go to a new tax base, which is a smaller tax base, that 0.4% is not the correct number anymore. It was actually 0.55% relative to current uh, 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 policy and about 0.7 percent relative to the current law. So we're, we're quite a bit below that f from this thing paying for itself. So why don't we get bigger effects? It is really driven by debt effects. Um, in particular, we get substantial debt effects in, in the model. And in particular, this, a lot of this debt is not financing new investment. It's actually financing a lot of existing investment. And you can see this with the corporate effective tax rates. In particular, these are effective tax rates. As you know, companies don't really pay the statutory rate. Um, they have various deductions and so forth, even before the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. And before the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, Act. We have this broken down by industry, but overall, about 21% uh, was the effective tax rate uh, that companies were actually paying. Um, it goes down under the, the, job, uh, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Uh, but notice by 2027, it returns a lot of the way. What's going on is that how the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act uh, basically works is that you get this expensive provision over a limited amount of investment over the first five years, and that expensing it basically is mostly just shifting the depreciation that companies would have already enjoyed over that 10-year window. It is better, they're better off in present value a bit, uh, but that's also one reason why that investment category was so cheap in the sense that most of it is shifting. Um, uh, it's essentially an interest-free loan against your a future tax bill. And so it really is not uh, it's, uh, uh, focused a lot on kind of new, new investment. Let me talk talk a little bit, a uh, uh, fewer minutes on Social Security, um, because this platform is really about lots of different uh, analysis. On, tr on Social Security uh, that uh, Steve will also uh, discuss on is, uh, uh, yes, we have slightly different projections on the, the Social Security exhaustion date. Um, we'll, we'll, I'll put that in quotes. It's not the official term anymore. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, in, it's, uh, depending on the assumptions, we can be a little bit closer to what CBO has projected or what Social Security uh, projects. I think, personally, the exhaustion date or depreciation uh, date is the, is the minor issue. For me, the bigger issue is that in fact, we're, we're going to have substantial shortfalls in Social Security that is uh, interacting with these, these uh, substantial de debt effects. You can go on our website, you can uh, run 4,096 combinations of how to fix Social Security and so forth. We're releasing our new version of Social Security Simulator um, in just a little bit. But let me give you some highlights here. And let me uh, talk about some straw man ideas, uh, packages. We're not advocating this. We're just taking what's commonly discussed out there and saying, Let's Let's look at three straw man uh, ideas here. And the one that we call this the liberal plan, mostly getting more, uh, fixing Social Security through increases in tax revenue. That would be a tax, a payroll tax increase, um, as well as what's called the donut hole. The idea is that uh, uh, you, you, in fact, have uh, a current earnings cap, and so you can apply this new tax up to the earnings cap. Uh, but then the idea is you have this donut hole where uh, uh, beyond that earnings cap, you're not taxed. But then, after you make it, uh, enough money, you're taxed again at, at another rate. And that donut hole is the, is the area in between that you're not taxed. And so, suppose you have the donut hole $500,000, um, and that's not indexed to inflation. So, eventually, what's going to happen, that donut hole will shrink over time. And so, the payroll tax will, in fact, be levied over a, a larger and larger uh, wage base. And we won't give you any credit for paying this, this, donut, uh, this tax above the donut hole. Uh, the conservative idea is more of let's, let's increase the retirement age, um, let's uh, fiddle with the adjustment, inflation adjustment, let's cut benefits upon a progressive basis, and then the balance is a combination of the two. Uh, two of the more liberal ones, a payroll tax increase, uh, as well as a, a smaller donut hole uh, application, a progressive benefit 
uh, uh, cut from the more conservative uh, plan. And again, we're, these are, we're not advocating. These are obviously extremely simple, the purposely straw men, but I'm trying to make a bigger point here. And that is all three of these would, in fact, quote, unquote, save the trust fund. And in particular, here is our, the blue line. It's a projection of the trust fund of the current law, the, or we call current policy. I'll come back to that in a second. And the dotted lines are for the, uh, for the, the conservative liberal and balance. Now, they save the trust fund. In, two, in very different ways. The liberal one gets money immediately, but then tracks the kind of the current policy uh, income surplus. So the income surplus, this is how much money that you, in fact, are, 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 are paying out versus how much money you're, you're taking in uh, in taxes. And, in fact, it's actually uh, just, just realize that that should have been taxes less uh, benefits, my bad. Um, so, but you know, it's, it's taxes less benefits, not benefits less taxes. But in any case, the income surplus um, uh, line is the blue line. It's going way down over time. These are in constant year dollars, 2016 dollars. We're going to have a $300 billion shortfall in this trust fund exhaust. That is going to increase to over a trillion dollars a year in, in current dollars um, if nothing is done. And so these different plans will, will attack it differently. The, 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 the more conservative approach um, is because the, 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 it relies a lot on the retirement age increasing slowly over time. It's going to wear in uh, much slower and so forth. And the balanced approach. But... The key about it, if you look at those approaches relative to the GDP, they all have, yes, no, no question, the conservative one is going to have a bigger impact, a bigger positive impact on GDP. And that's simply because when you take away some benefits, people are forced to save. That's going to lead to more capital accumulation and so forth. But even the, even the liberal and the balanced ones, the impact on GDP is not substantially negative. Um, and in particular, it's, it's, uh, in the case of the balance, it's still actually a little bit higher GDP under the balance than it is under the current law. What is going on, and this will be my last slide here, it really is what do we really mean, why well, I should say relative to the current policy. What do we really mean? What's the benchmark? So there's two ways of thinking about Social Security. The one is current law. Current law would basically, one interpretation of that would be, hey, you know what? Trust fund runs out of money. We have 75% you know, of revenue coming in that can pay, uh, revenue that comes in that can pay about 75% worth of benefits. And so at that point, we just, you know, slash benefits by a quarter or more, including on your nine-year-old year grandmother, and it, that's, that's just kind of tough. And by definition, therefore, there is, in fact, no problem. And the reason why there's no problem is because you're just going to slash benefits to meet um, the, re the resources that, that you have. I think, uh, so therefore, anything that you do that's basically save the trust fund of new taxes would, would be negative relative to that, simply because um, there's nothing going to be more positive on the economy than forcing people to save uh, uh, more themselves. Um, but at the same time, that's probably very implausible. We're really not going to slash benefits relative on a 90-year-old person. So, but relative to current policy, um, it, it, by current policy, the idea would be if we think of Social Security as a, just a part of the unified budget. And that is, in fact, you know, uh, it, it's not technically true. It's technically off budget, but we all, you know, think about the unified surplus measure or the deficit. That's the CBO measure that everybody uh, focuses on. Um, it, but if we think of it now as part of the, the entire budget, Interestingly, that, e that e even um, the balance plan that has tax increases is actually going to be more positive on GDP than current policy because the current policy in that case basically means when you have these shortfalls, they become debt. And debt is even more negative on the economy than uh, uh, using new revenue uh, uh, mechanisms. And so clearly, it, 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 when it comes to Social Security, quicker action is going to be more effective. Um, by the way, the distinction between a benefit cut and a tax increase is in many ways, it's a huge debate, but in many ways artificial because, in fact, your benefits are, in fact, linked to your earnings, which are, in fact, linked to your payroll contributions. And so as a result of that, there's a marginal linkage. If I cut benefits in a progressive way versus increasing taxes in a progressive way, that distinction is actually very minor. Um, both 
are in fact in a, a increase in taxes or in a net a lifetime sense having the same resource impact or you could design it to have the same resource impact on higher income people. And so as a result of that, you know, I, th I think what we really need is, is holistic modeling uh, like this that allows for the impact on, on GDP um, and as well as distributional effects that we haven't reported here, um, but it, it, that it really does recognize um, that, uh, that sometimes labels uh, really don't matter very much. So, uh, so now I want to, uh, I think Tom will go first. And again, as I mentioned earlier this morning, have in, tremendous, you know, we, we, we view our job as really trying to be helpful to the, to the official experts um, in, in this area. So we really welcome their comments and have told them to, you know, uh, say whatever they want. <laughs> We're very encouraged uh, that they're, they're here to talk. Do you want to sit there? Okay. I'll, I'll sit. Uh, well, thank you, Kent, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak uh, to everyone uh, today. Um, since Kimberly introduced uh, me by saying I've been at the Joint Committee for a long time, I thought maybe in terms of my comments uh, I'd take the uh, gray hair uh, approach uh, and step, step back a little bit, ask uh, what's really, uh, in a broad sense, what's behind uh, uh, the uh, Penn Wharton uh, budget model uh, initiative. Uh, and, and that's really, why do we, why do we have models for uh, public policy analysis? And it's because we're trying to have both qualitative and uh, quantitative guidance uh, to provide policymakers, our elected, uh, our elected representatives, in making decisions that uh, are important for our future. Um, this is not new. Uh, so what we're talking about uh, today, or what uh, the work uh, that Kent uh, has presented, is uh, properly titled uh, Advances. He's trying to talk about where we are now. Well, think about a little bit about uh, where we've come, because I think that also highlights some potential problems or things to think about in terms of where we are now. Uh, I won't go back to the founding of the Republic, but uh, if we <laughs> go back to the uh, Kennedy round of tax cuts, um, for those of you that are old enough, for those of you that have read some history, you'll know that uh, they were, to a large degree, based on what we now consider fairly simple, but some simple economic modeling. You can read the Council Economic Advisors uh, uh, report with some projections of what would happen to uh, income and federal revenues uh, if, taxes, uh, if taxes were cut, notwithstanding a short-run change in the deficit. Similarly, economic modeling was important in terms of motivating the pol uh, policy choice that led to the uh, income tax surcharge, uh, surtax of 1968 and 1969. But as you've gone, if you step forward into the next decade, you find out that our knowledge, our modeling is always a little bit imperfect. We, learn, we find out that there are a lot of things we don't know. So think of the twin energy shocks in the, uh, in the 1970s. And what did economic modeling have to tell us at the time about that? Um, not much. In fact, still trying to figure out a lot about what went on in the 1970s and, and why. What created uh, uh, stagflation? So I think when we think about the model, uh, when we think about modeling, what modeling can tell us, uh, it's important to think through the models and to remember that our knowledge is, imp uh, is imperfect. Kent uh, mentioned uh, what many see as the anomaly of Japan and the deficits in Japan, noted that Japan has very high saving rates, so the net uh, saving rate in Japan is in fact uh, quite, uh, quite high. But notwithstanding, I think, the evidence that uh, uh, Kent cited, we don't have perfect knowledge about the effects of uh, deficits on the economy, in particular uh, the timing uh, or magnitude. And so when Kent uh, just described that he said, well, uh, if I don't do this, the economy will collapse. Uh, he was saying the economy of the Penn Wharton model uh, will collapse. Uh, he can't tell you that, uh, what was the end year, was it 2040? He can't tell you that in 2040, under current policy, that the U.S. economy will, uh, uh, will collapse. Well, how have policymakers uh, really uh, evolved in terms of uh, analysis as, as well? As I noted, it was important in the, uh, in the 1960s, trying to figure out what to do was important in the 1970s. Uh, with increasing uh, deficits in the 1980s, you saw a lot of emphasis uh, put on 
uh, uh, projections of what was going to happen to the federal deficit. I think in terms of budget scorekeeping, it put a lot of pressure on uh, scorekeeping and on estimates. Uh, also put a lot of pressure on policymakers of how do they beat the model. If they know what the model is, uh, maybe they can have a policy that's consistent with the model, so consistent with the rules that, we set, uh, that uh, they establish, uh, but also achieves a policy goal that you know, they, they find uh, um, advantageous for a number of other, other reasons. Um, started off with many five-year uh, uh, policy, uh, policy horizons, uh, but members thought uh, uh, that five years was somewhat inadequate, so we've moved now to a 10-year planning horizon. Look at that in terms of cash flow. The deficits that uh, Kent's measuring are all measured on a cash flow basis. Of course, we know economically there are, are a number of uh, people that uh, model out uh, lifetime, uh, uh, lifetime deficits, uh, generational, uh, generational accounting, a number of different ways to, uh, to, look, uh, to look at this, but the federal government kind of operates on this cash flow basis. So we've moved from five years to looking at 10 years. Social Security Administration, for a number of good reasons, looks at an even longer, uh, a longer horizon. In the last round of uh, discussion of budget resolution, uh, a number of members of Congress contemplated moving to a 20-year budget, uh, uh, budget planning horizon. Putting longer horizons on our modeling puts greater uncertainty uh, uh, on the outcomes. Uh, uh, we probably feel a lot better about knowing um, uh, what, how the population will change over the next two, three years than we do over the next 20, uh, over the next 20 years. And in terms of just people filing returns, uh, the number of people out there is an important uh, factor in terms of, uh, in terms of defining our, t uh, our tax base. Something else that you've seen uh, uh, arise over the past uh, now three decades with the importance of thinking about the cash flow deficit, about the modeling, about the scorekeeping, is you've seen the rise of a lot of other uh, organizations willing to offer quantitative economic analysis. Uh, you've seen uh, in the Washington, D in the inside the Beltway uh, uh, group, uh, you've seen accounting firms uh, establish their own uh, uh, independent uh, uh, modeling. They often uh, use this to uh, uh, talk to members about policy, policy proposals. Coalitions uh, advocate broad reforms, uh, are often uh, employing now outside, uh, uh, outside modelers. See, think tanks have created their own uh, uh, broad uh, uh, models, some to think about uh, American Enterprise Institute, the Tax Foundation, the Tax, uh, uh, tax Policy Center. Penn Wharton uh, budget model would be another, uh, another example. More analysis, taking different approaches, thinking through that. I think we have to think you know, professionally. That's all, all good to think about uh, how, to, how to group A approach it, how to group B approach it, because Knowledge is not, uh, is not perfect. Everything is not, uh, is not known. But also something else that comes, uh, that we found uh, 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 on our staff, uh, that we found with increased, model, uh, increased modeling, increased I ideas, the positive aspect of it, is from a policymaker's uh, perspective, there's often a lot more noise. Um, each model, to the extent that it's different, if there's a different outcome, well, they want to know which one's right. Uh, why, is, why is Kent's better or worse than, uh, uh, than the tax foundations? Or why is the tax policy centers better or worse than the American Enterprise uh, uh, Institute? So with more models, and I'll call it more noise, and I don't mean that uh, uh, pejorative, uh, pejoratively, maybe in a few cases I do, but not, uh, not, as, a uniform, uh, not as a uniform statement, comes in increasing pressure for what's behind the, the models. You know, a real popular buzzword for us is, is transparency. So there's pressure to spend more time explaining where the, uh, uh, where the results come from, what's underlying the model, what are the assumptions, what are the, uh, what's, the, um, uh, what's the data. Uh, if you go flip back, uh, and, and I won't uh, uh, really take any time uh, uh, on it, uh, if you flip, flip back to the charts that uh, Kent presented, he presented some differences. He had a, a comment at the one, well, he found that his total uh, was much closer to 
CBO's recent projections than what he was representing as uh, the Joint Committee's projections. Well, a basic question on that is CBO's ba most recent projections uh, are based on the 2018 macroeconomic baseline. The Joint Committee estimates that he was reporting from for uh, Public Law 115.97 was based on the CBO 2017 macroeconomic baseline. CBO 2018 macroeconomic baseline forecast greater economic growth for 2018, 2019, 2020 than did the 2017 baseline. That leads to potentially a significant effect, uh, effect there. Um, so we don't know what the base. Uh, we don't know what the baseline is. That we found in a number of uh, discussions uh, tends to uh, confuse the policy ma uh, makers. Uh, and I don't mean confused in that they can't figure that out, but they'll sometimes be talking past uh, past each other. Uh, so it makes it hard to center in on what the real uh, sometimes what the real uh, what the real issue is. Um, I, and so I uh, I guess to uh, since I'm down to eight seconds. I'll, uh, <laughs> uh, I'll, I want to emphasize that in working through um, the, the uh, uh, analysis that the Penn Wharton model uh, can offer, it's important to think about what's behind it uh, and how to explain it. Because for the policy decision process, be it the qualitative aspect of it or the quantitative aspect, the policymakers increasingly want to know where it's where it's coming from uh, and and why, uh, and they want to understand it because they want to think of what's the ramification and if I modify uh, my options some, why is that result differently? What's going to drive uh, what's going to drive that result? Uh, but uh, with that, I'll turn the time uh, time back. Uh, great. Uh, thank you, Kent. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Steve Ballmer starting out. Uh, great setup for discussion. I, I guess I'd like to suggest, first of all, the work that we do in our office at Social Security Administration, Office of the Actuary. Uh, we make, as Tom and Kent have both mentioned, we make projections out for 75 years, sometimes even further, uh, on what the actual financial status of the Social Security Trust Funds will be. And in order to do that, uh, we have to make projections of the entire U.S. population, all the aspects that Tom was mentioning, uh, the U.S. economy, uh, and everything that deals more directly with Social Security. Uh, and I guess what I'd want to suggest is what we really specifically do is in some sense broader and in some sense narrower than what's been discussed so far. Uh, I think both Kent and Tom are talking a little bit more about the revenue tax side, and we, of course, look much much more kind of balance between the two as we need to in order to see how the two of them are working out. Uh, we're, we're narrower, on the other hand, uh, because we do not look as broadly to the total federal budget, uh, and we look more at really just the operations of Social Security. That said, one of the other distinctions is that we're in a pure budget model uh, that uh, I know Tom is working on every day and, uh, and Kent also, you have to worry about every single thing, not only in the economy, which we all worry about, but also all aspects of federal uh, changes, federal interventions that might occur. We look a little bit past that in our projections. We basically look towards the future of the economic growth as being a little bit like what Kent was saying past 2040, that things will work their way out, uh, that things can go off the rails only so much things will happen. We don't explicitly try to indicate what will happen for the overall federal budget in order to keep it in order, uh, because as has been cited sometimes in the past, if budget deficits were to rise to the extent that some have projected, interest rates could possibly rise to a point where that would cause the budget deficits to rise even more, and pretty soon you get a death spiral, and it just doesn't work. So at some point you have to assume that things will sort of work out, and we do that basically. Now that said, with respect to tax changes and tax implications, this is where we spend a lot of time with our friend Tom. He gets probably more emails from us than, than, than he would want to say, because when we do have specific things of tax legislation that would have an effect on the overall tax base, the economy, and also specific uh, tax revenues coming to the Social Security Trust Funds, uh, we do talk to Tom and people at Office Tax Analysis at Treasury. Now, speaking of which, I, I do have to sort of give a, a sort of a mea culpa here. Uh, uh, Earlier, Kent asked for us to be hard on his model and everything, so I have to do full disclosure. I did spend four years' time at Penn 
uh, in, an, in an earlier life, but that doesn't mean that I would be any less harsh on Kent, <laughs> because we've also done time together when he was at Treasury some time back and, uh, and had some great discussions. Sometimes in disagreements comes out the best warning, uh, and, and it was really, really wonderful. So let me jump into a couple of little slides here. I won't spend a lot of time on these. Uh, the legislative mandate for our trustees for the Social Security Administration and for Medicare, for that matter, to do these longer-term projections really is in the law. We've got to do uh, we've, we've got to say what we think over the next five years, as Tom was saying, uh, this is because this legislation goes back a while. We've gone pretty much to 10 years and, old, old, and more recent focus. But also we have to look at the actual status of the programs, which has to go out a lot further because we want to be able to show Congress what is expected to happen over basically the course of the, the remaining lifetime of our youngest participants, a 20-year-old in the workforce. So we've got to run out something like 75 years to give you an idea. Uh, just a real quick thing in, in our uh, – in our most recent trustees report that came out just earlier this month, uh, a couple of things happened. We changed our economic projections a little bit more conservative uh, than before based on the not very good uh, labor productivity growth that we've had in recent years. But I would cite, however, that uh, our projections for economic growth over the next 10 years and even beyond are more optimistic than CBO, but less optimistic than the president's budget. So we figure we're in a pretty good place here. We're sort of, you know, we have them on, on either side of us. Uh, the, the other really big thing is that we've had massive changes in disability, uh, uh, disability applications coming into our programs, not only Social Security, but also uh, into the SSI program. Uh, you can see here we do pay attention. Now, Kent, Kent, this is one thing where Kent and I would disagree a little bit about the idea of trust fund reserve depletion. Uh, that's, the little joke is we're not really sure exactly what a, what a trust fund looks like when it is an exhausted trust fund. But when the reserves in the trust fund become depleted, uh, then we do have an issue, as, as Kent well described. Then we still have continuing revenue that can pay a portion of what is scheduled in the law for benefits, what the obligation is, but not all of it. And the reason why we think the reserve depletion date is important is just simply a look back at history. If you look at when the Congress has actually acted and has made changes, it's when we're at or approaching very soon reserve depletion. You can just see throughout the whole history of the program uh, that this, this is absolutely the case. You can see, for example, the little blue line on the bottom, the disability insurance program. You can see places at which it bounced. Those were tax rate reallocations that had been done simply between the OESI and DI funds, the most recent one, in 2015. And you can also see that we've had some rather dramatic improvement in the actual status of the DI fund going forward. And this is where we have to, as you know, Tom and Kent were both mentioning, we have to have full disclosure and full understanding of what the assumptions we are, but paying very, very careful attention, as Steve Ballmer mentioned, to what the evolution is of new data. And here's a look at new data. These are applications coming to Social Security. You can see the applications coming to Social Security for disability benefits peaked in 2010. Big surprise. We had this great recession. Uh, but they've been dropping ever since. Now you can see how badly we have done on projecting the applications turning back up to what we think would be more of a steady state situation. All the way through 2017, they just keep dropping. We're working on trying to understand exactly why. It's a great news story. It's good for the solvency of the DI fund. Uh, it's good for a, a window into the American people, not as many people feeling they're disabled. Uh, we'd like to be doing better projections, and we're, we're working on that by way of trying to understand what's there. Similarly, the disability incidence rates, this is the percentage of people who are insured but not yet receiving a benefit already, uh, who start to receive a benefit in a given year. And you can see that again peaked in 2010. It's been dropping like crazy. Uh, and uh, we're projecting that it's going to turn around, as we have been for a while, but these turnarounds have simply not been happening. Again, good news, uh, speaking more to the uncertainty, not just in the very long term, but even in the near term. Uh, and this all actually shows you relative to the black line back in our 2008 trustees report, which is the last year we had projections. And Kent, you might even have been with us then. I'm mm. trying to remember. Uh, this is before anybody knew there was a recession right on the horizon the assumptions we had, and you can see our steady growth in the number of disabled worker beneficiaries. We thought it would just be rising, just following the population, the aging of the population. As it turned out, the recession on the red line, you can see to the left of today's history, we had a big bump in the recession. No surprise in that. But you can see the extent to which we have given that back in terms of the number of people receiving benefits. And even from last year's trustees report to the most recent trustees report, we're even lower now in the numbers of beneficiaries, and the trend is going very, very negative. 
quite different from what most people had thought in recent years. Mm -hmm. Now, to, to the cash flow issue that Kent was talking about, we obviously pay attention to that. I would have to tell you we do not tend to look at these in dollar amounts, especially not now, now in the budget. When you're looking at just 10 years, looking at nominal dollars, that's fine. We kind of have a sense of that. If we're going to go out more than 10 years, we think nominal dollars really don't make any sense at all because, you know, a nominal dollar out in 2050 compared to today, how, how can we fathom the $55 loaf of bread? Uh, I'm probably out of date on that because I'm used to thinking back when I was a kid, it was maybe under a buck for a loaf of bread. I guess that's no more. Uh, so so we, we don't even like to look at so-called constant dollars, which are CPI indexed, because the economy tends to work with real growth. So we think that's a little bit you know, tough to look out beyond 10 years. So we prefer to look at things relative to, in this case, our taxable payroll, uh, which is about 35% of the total GDP. You can also look at your dollar amounts going out further into the future as a percentage of GDP. We have a slide on that. And this simply just shows on the red line what the revenue to the DI, Disability Insurance Trust Fund, is looking like as a share of our taxable payroll. And the blue line is the cost. And you can see back in the recession period where the cost rose up above the money coming in. There we go. Our trust fund reserve started to come down. You can see the little bump up where the Congress most recently gave us a shot at some extra money uh, coming in from the tax rate reallocation. Uh, and in the future, you can see what the shortfall is because the projected cost of providing all the benefits is on the dashed line. But the dark blue line is what we will actually be able to pay. And here's the interesting thing about the DI Trust Fund, why we have had such rather dramatic multiple year extensions in our projected year of reserve depletion. And that's because we're at a point now where even if we reach the point in 2032 where we project reserve depletion, we're still going to have 96 cents coming in in revenue for every dollar of projected benefits. What that means is that you don't have to have much of a change in the amount of revenue you have in the trust fund around 2032 to give you a couple more years. Uh, so you know, st you know, stand by and we'll see what happens. If anything, there's a, a very distinct possibility that we could be going out further on that reserve depletion date just based on our, our recent experience. Similar thing here for the OESDI program as a whole, a little bit difference here. We would drop down to about 79 cents on the dollar at reserve depletion in 2034, going down to 74 cents. That's actually a little bit better than we had in last year's projection. Uh, as I mentioned, percent of GDP, which is maybe in the context of what we're talking about here over the longer term, a better thing to look at. And you can see Social Security used to be, you know, about 4.3, 4.5% of GDP was the cost over the last 20, 30 years prior to the recession and prior to demographic changes, which are really the big driver here. You can see we're going to jump from just over 4 up to 6% of GDP in the future. Uh, this is a serious issue, and obviously if your tax rates stay the same and your percent of GDP cost goes up a lot, you have an issue. Why is that? Well, we have this thing called the age of dependency ratio, what demographics is destiny. You can see in the black line, this is simply the ratio of the number of people 65 and older in our population as a percentage of the what we used to think of as working age, 20 to 64 population. And you can see that that's going to go up like crazy. Why? Because the boomers are ever since 2008, moving into retirement age, no surprise. We knew that would be happening. But what has also happened is because of low birth rates after the boomers, which is why we call them boomers, because after them came lower birth rates, we're going to have lower birth rate generations filling the labor force, and we already do, which is going to cause this ratio to go up. Just to get a better feel for that, you can see the other two lines below. Those are what if, at the end of the baby boom generation, we'd stated either 3.3 births per woman, uh, which is what we'd average from 1946 to 65, or if we'd even just been at three births per woman, which is sort of a much more longer-term past average, you can see this age of dependency ratio would not have been going up like we're projecting now, and therefore the cost as percentage of payroll, cost as percentage of GDP would not be going up. It would be very, very similar. Uh, death rates have not been a, a big factor. In fact, uh, people used to think death rates are going to be dropping like a rock for a while, but since 2009 they have not for a number of reasons. It's not just opioids because death rates have really ceased dropping to the extent that they had been at essentially all ages and both genders. Uh, speaking to uncertainty, we have a couple of different ways of illustrating uncertainty that speak to really all the various assumptions we have on, in the trustees' report. But I did want to just take one more second, even though I'm at zero seconds here, but, okay, I, but, but, but Ken said we, we could take just yeah. a minute more, to speak just a tiny little bit about the budget scoring issue. Uh, and Again, the focus of the trustees' reports by law and by what we do is to really focus on the solvency, the viability, 
uh, the actual status of the trust funds. And the thing that's important there is if we did reach the point of trust fund reserve depletion, the trust funds have, let's see, how much authority do the trust funds have to borrow? Well, actually none. The trust funds have no borrowing authority. That's why I think both Tom and Ken were saying if we reach the point of reserve depletion and in 2032 for DI only had 96 cents on the dollar coming in, something would have to be done. And the key here is the Congress has every single time in the past we've approached a point where a change in law would be necessary and in order to maintain the benefits, they have changed the law. They've stepped up and made changes every single time. So reserve depletion has really been the motivation for Congress to make changes. Uh, we would all wish that changes would be made sooner rather than later. That would be nice. But when your back is against the wall, you really have to act. If the trust funds, like the rest of government, had the ability to borrow, which is, Tom, what, over $20 trillion now? Remember, this is the rest of government that has over $20 trillion of borrowing. The Social Security trust funds actually are to the plus of $2.9 trillion. So there's no borrowing by Social Security. In fact, there can't be. And, in fact, the roughly $20 trillion borrowed by the rest of the government, which is the full debt subject to limit, $3 trillion of that has actually been borrowed from the Social Security trust funds. Uh, and, and this then gets to the issue of when we are looking at Social Security now on the path towards starting to spend down some of its trust fund reserves, should we look at that really a uh, matter of putting pressure on the budget and creating problems? Or is it a matter of Social Security has been putting money in since 1983 because of the 1983 amendments, building up its savings account, uh, which Kent was saying is such a good idea earlier, building up the savings account, and then we'll start drawing it down. Our, our hope, our sense is that all the financial markets and everybody in government well understands, because we've been putting out in these trustees reports every year, that where the trust funds were saving and putting away excess money into this, allowing the rest of government to borrow less from the public, less publicly held debt, than there would otherwise be by $3 trillion now, that if the trust funds, as has been projected for many, many years, now starts to spend down those reserves, that simply means the rest of the government will now have to start to realize that $3 trillion that so far has been borrowed from the trust funds, they will have to borrow it from the public. And that should not really be a shock to anybody. We would like to hope that this would not be a shock to the financial markets or to anybody else in their expectations for GDP in the future, because this is information that's all well known. So that's the, the one thing that I just wanted to sort of mention about the budget scoring issue. The budget scoring convention, I think we're all familiar with this, it's, it's, it's not just CBO, OMB, and everybody else, is to, in effect, presume that the trust fund programs, Social Security and Medicare, if they reach a point where they deplete the reserves, there's this implicit assumption that a law will suddenly come forth that will allow all the benefits to still be paid and the money will come, well, I guess it will just come out of the general fund of the Treasury, requiring a lot more borrowing from the public. Uh, and, I mean, that's fine if you want to make that assumption. All I would just suggest is if you're going to put that forth as a budget scoring convention, be really straight about it and indicate it, and don't just show the rising debt without, uh, without sort of illustrating that. And one little illustration of that is this thing here that we had based on some 2017 CBO projections. We just put the little green and, and purple lines in here of what the debt would be projected based on CBO's 2017 baseline if you did not assume that the shortfalls for Social Security and Medicare would be made up by money that is not allowable under law and has no precedent uh, under, under, under any law to be able to be provided. And I'm really tickled that Kent's going to be doing longer-term projections out here all the way at, out to at least 75 years, yeah, we hope. Yeah. Great. That will allow us to sort of look at this kind of distinction. We'll hope that Kent will similarly look at this distinction going into the future. Uh, the last thing I just want to say is uh, we have a whole bunch of, uh, we'd love to have the time to talk about ways of changing. Social Security can't touch nicely on that. But we have a whole bunch of stuff up on our web page where we do have full disclosure of all the assumptions, all the methods, and everything else. So I wish Steve Ballmer were here still so we could say, Steve, here's another source of data to look at. Yeah, yeah. No, that's fantastic. I mean, uh, why don't we, uh, if you have questions, and uh, thanks for both of those comments. If you want, okay, you have some there. And I think we probably have about 10 minutes or, or so, yeah. Um, yeah, go ahead. So, yeah, please, uh, please uh, submit some more questions on cards, or if you feel comfortable um, speaking publicly, you can head up to the mic as well. I'm going to start off with um, maybe one that all three of you can talk about. So. Kent was saying that Penn Wharton budget model is a cutting-edge model. 
Um, what do you think about what makes a model cutting edge or can differentiate models from one to the other? And also, uh, why exactly is the closure rule necessary? And is there types of models where you don't need that kind of assumption? Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll go quite quickly, and I completely agree with uh, Tom's point in that it's such a crowded space, especially on the tax side, you know, trying to understand um, differences in, in models. Well, all of our documentation is also online, and if anything, it's probably overwhelming, and that, 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 that is an issue as well. Um, it, it, so the way we can think about the Penn Wharton budget model, why we did it is because we were on, um, really trying to do uh, a couple of things. The first one is to uh, have, if we take tax as an example, a, a fully integrated tax platform that is, in fact, integrated not with just tax by itself, because lots of the models that were out there really simplify a lot on the tax side. I and mean, it's not, not JCT, but a lot of the other, what you, you, what you mentioned, um, other models really simplified a lot of that, um, but then have that interact with the actual census level data. And so, in fact, even though economists spend so much time talking about dynamics and how important dynamics are, in fact, micro simulation and the static stuff is still crucial. Um, and really getting that right, because that ultimately feeds into the, 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 to the dynamic model. The dynamic model itself, what is more cutting edge about it is is this uh, the fact that it's this overlapping generations model that has incorporates all sorts of uncertainty um, and other uh, very rich details that um, existing models, which much more, are much more calibrated to unrelated previous policies, um, are not going to pick up. So it's going to pick up the fact that in a matter is the United States is on a very unique path. We haven't been on this hugely exploding debt path um, in the same way in, in the past. And so previous policies are often very different in terms of how they change marginal tax rates, but they're also, it's also a very different world uh, back then. And then finally, we um, completely agree with Steve and, and Tom as well, the importance of flushing out sensitivity analysis, really flushing out the assumptions. And so you can go on our website, for example, and play with different assumptions and actually uh, you know, see, see what the, the, those differences are. I think that's incredibly important because ultimately at the end of the day, you want arguments not over ideology, you want arguments over assumptions. And if we can actually get arguments over assumptions, and have a really clear understanding of what are the differences in these models and the differences in assumptions, that's an informed debate. Um, some people can have, you know, what economists call elasticities, very different views on that. Uh, that's fine. Um, you can dial that differently in our model. If you're liberal, you can do one thing, conservative another thing, but at least now we're having a rational debate on assumptions and not over, and, and modeling details and not over uh, ideology. Um, and I'll ask a follow-up question. Could um, I just, just, yeah, yeah, oh, please. Comment also, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I just want to say that, you know, we, you know, from our point of view, we welcome Penn Wharton coming in. Uh, I think it goes back about 04, CBO started coming, doing long-range modeling. I think from our point of view, the more people who are in the game, the better. We have more people to talk to, more people to compare assumptions with, to discuss, debate uh, about what would make sense. Uh, and I think our, our, our projections obviously are, are a much longer uh, view out there. So one of the things we often talk about, and it's a little bit of a joke in our office, not to put a ruler on recent trends to try to see what the future is, but at this point in time, maybe as much as any, and this perhaps speaks a little bit of what Ken's talking about, is do we have fundamental things going on in our society now? Uh, you know, birth rates have been low, well, in, you know, inflation rates are low. There are lots of things going on now, and one of the things that we always struggle with is when we see something for three, four, or five years, is this just a temporary blip and we're going to go back to what the long-term average has been or is there something fundamental going on? And for us, that's the most important thing is to think about what were the conditions of the past that contributed towards that experience and then what do we all think holistically are going to be the conditions in the future that will possibly result in, in different assumptions for the future? And that's really what it's all about. Um, so um, a follow-up question about how we pinpoint our elasticities yeah. and um, how we 
you know, start our projection backward in time. Um, how do we how do we calibrate and make those decisions um, for, say, labor and savings elasticity? Yeah. Um, so that's also on the website. We have discussion papers. Actually, on the simulators, there's links to uh, resources. Uh, a very rich literature on things like labor supply elasticity, savings elasticities. I see some people here, in fact, who contributed to this literature. Um, and so what we, for us, the idea is we don't have to take a stand because ultimately we want people taking debates, you know, debating about these things. And so the idea is we provide the platform. You can actually change the elasticities, um, to, to look at different outcomes yourself. Um, it is true. One of the issues is that uh, people say, okay, but you have a baseline setting. You kind of, that's in some sense, you know, a recommendation. You, you have a default. How do you come up with those defaults? And there it does require a subjective decision, and, uh, and that is based on, on the literature, kind of an immediate value. But ultimately, you know, we've had people from both the left and the right say, you know, love your model, but, you know, the default setting should be very here or it should be here. And that's fine, you know, I mean, that's fine to have those debates, because um, I think those are, are, are actually rational debates that we can go back to the literature, we can actually look at empirical studies to, to, to try to have a, a discussion about. And finally, right, did you? Okay. Uh, actually, just to make a couple comments related to the last two questions, um, I agree with Kent uh, that uh, the micro simulation models are uh, are really critical in terms of our analysis and what we present to the uh, to the members. A suggestion I'll make to Kent for future uh, uh, presentations is strike that word static from the presentation because none of the micro simulation yeah. models that I, that you're using none that we use are static. It ends up being a pejorative and misleading uh, uh, label in the, eye, uh, in the eyes of uh, a number of the consumers of the information of the, the models. The model data uh, that goes into it is extremely uh, detailed. Uh, and one, of the high, uh, one of the things you didn't highlight in terms of differences between estimates that you had done compared to our Estimates, uh, for example, uh, net operating loss deductions, the changes uh, in Public Law 115.97 related to that. Well, I would guess that one of the main reasons for that is because our micro simulation model for uh, the corporate tax base is uh, a 10-year, actually, well, actually, more than 10-year panel of every corporation in the United States with more than $50 million in assets. So you name any corporation that you can think of, and it's a data point in our model tracked for over 10 years. So we don't have to think about net operating losses for the steel industry. We can think of individual companies within the steel industry, and they're, they're different. And there's the law change impacts the different co uh, companies different, uh, differently. Uh, and, so, and moving then to the macro analysis, it's for us, the microeconomic work of our corporate model, our individual model, I like to characterize it as, as the feedstock uh, for the macro models. It's the source of determining the user cost of capitals, the uh, um, average marginal tax rates across different income uh, groups, average marginal and average tax, uh, tax rates for our labor supply uh, effects, for our saving, uh, uh, for our saving effects. Uh, and since I didn't bring slides, I did bring a party favor for anybody that wants to uh, carry it to office. Uh, we recently uh, produced sort of an overview of uh, the three macroeconomic models and the assumptions that underlie them uh, that, we, uh, that we used in our recent analysis and that uh, we continue to uh, develop. Uh, it's available on our website, but uh, I'll drop uh, a bundle of hard copies up here for after the session. Yeah. Could, could I just add, you know, on the idea of the model, the model of the model, uh, I think I'm sure we'd all agree there's, there's no sort of perfect model. I, I know our model is a mixture of micro and macro. Sounds like Tom's is too. I think most models are that. And really the, the key is to try to develop the model given the data that are available that makes best use of those data to make the best possible projections you can. Uh, where, you know, Tom, and we wish we had access to individual income tax records uh, so we could actually have micro model on that. We don't have that. Uh, uh, Tom has that, and Office Tax Analysis of Treasury has that. But we do have individual records for things like work histories for individuals, and so our micro model is is more focused in the areas where we actually have the micro data available. So I think we're all all you know. I don't, again, I don't think there's a magic model, one size fits all. But I I think that all entities 
OMB, CBO, uh, and all the entities here are really, as far as I know, making the best possible use. I'm looking forward to seeing more of the progress you make, Kent. Thank you. Um, so this sort of gets at, at the same issue. So there's many models. There's, you know, three models or more, depending on how you count them, sitting at this table. Um, do certain models have strengths or are better at doing certain estimates? Are there strengths and weaknesses? Is there something good to be found everywhere? Sure. I mean, uh, well, there are, there are crappy well, models. Yeah. There are what? <laughs> there can be crappy models. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. um, let me just build on the la uh, last point. One of the reasons we have multiple macroeconomic models is U.S. economy is huge. To model it, you have to make simplifying uh, uh, assumptions. Uh, and so we have three models that make different simplifying assumptions to highlight different, uh, uh, different aspects of the economy. It's nice when... Uh, we're looking at a, a proposed policy change. If they all say about the same thing, uh, then you can you feel pretty good uh, pretty good about that. Uh, if they don't say the same thing, then it's we think a lot about why why don't they? What are we highlighting? As a simple case, one of our models uh, has no uh, international sector. It's a closed economy uh, a closed economy model. That doesn't make it useless because one of the things it highlights is the observed empirical fact that there are some households that are savers and there are some households that are non-savers. And so if we're looking at uh, proposals that may change uh, pension systems, saving, uh, saving incentives, it's really kind of important to have a look at that that reflects the reality of the, of, uh, the world, that there are some of you out there in the, uh, in the audience that just spend every dime that comes in uh, and are maybe borrowing constrained. And there's some of you out there, the rest of you out there are sitting potentially on large nest eggs. And you behave differently uh, in response to after-tax returns. I, I just I couldn't agree more with Tom. I mean, we have a, a pure sort of a short-range model that just looks out 10 years. We have a long-range model that looks out long-term. They're both sort of a mix of micro and macro. We also have a pure micro-simulation model uh, that, that we use. And all of these have positives. Uh, and just as Tom says, if you can look at the results of all of them, uh, it's actually more fun when they don't agree because then you can see what's different about them and they can speak to each other and you can learn from them. It's not fun when they don't agree and you have an hour to decide uh, what you're going to tell the members of Congress. <laughs> That's less fun. You know, a, fun. a distinction I would make is, you know, a lot of the, the models that uh, have been used in uh, D.C., you know, over the decades, um, in many cases, they're where they will look at a previous tax change or a previous spending policy mm -hmm. or something like that and then view that as the basis for a completely different policy going forward. For us, the idea is you want to have a forward-looking model, especially given the debt path that we are on, um, and then incorporate the borrowing constraint types right into the model so we have these these types who are borrowing constrained as well as in our model. Um, and, but then the, the, the proof of the, the validation is then saying, can we have this, uh, this forward-looking model? If we go back in time now, can we validate against, against the past data? Because that's a big difference than, than saying uh, a tax change that we're doing today that is maybe very unique in history is going to behave the same way as a tax change in the past. And so uh, where a lot of the Keynesian models, for example, don't always pick up uh, uh, the right effects, in my opinion, is because they are not um, always the forward-looking. They often get debt, uh, for example, wrong. And, and one of the challenges, of course, is that when you have multiple models, how do you blend the results ultimately? And that becomes extremely uh, challenging, and uh, in so far, no one's really. You would need hundreds of years of data um, to really do that uh, uh, well. So our approach is uh, is actually an integrated model that you actually build out lots of these elements into the into the consistent model, and then you go back in time um, and see and validate against past policies, past demographics, and things like that before you then allow these forward-looking models to, to project the, the, the future. And then another question is, um, what is the mechanism that causes higher debt um, to affect growth? 
um, if indeed it does. Yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. So um, the, the, the mechanism actually goes all the way back to Adam Smith and then later Paul Samuelson. And that is, if in fact you are not the small open economy, you're not a banana republic, uh, part of your capital stock has to be financed from domestic households. And in particular, the United States is a large open economy. We have 4% of the world's population, but we have a, almost uh, over 25% of the world's capital. Of listed capital, it's even higher. Of listed debt uh, or uh, traded debt is, is even much higher. So we're actually a large open economy. And if you look at the uh, marginal take-up of government debt, for example, it's only about 40 cents of every dollar that's purchased uh, by foreigners on equity. It's even a lot less than that. And so the idea is that if, in fact, the government is now floating additional debt, um, some of that household saving that otherwise would have gone on productive investment is now going to finance that government debt. It's like your, the debt means we consume more today and therefore are saving less today, and therefore we're going to have uh, a less capital accumulation. And so sometimes people say, well, again, Japan, they've gotten away with it. But in fact, that's a narrow interpretation because they actually have very high level of total national saving. Or people will look at you know, the recent recession and say, hey, wait a minute, you know, we had a big run up in debt. Interest rates were quite low. But of course, again, the causality just reversed. In particular, people came to the United States. After we kind of screwed up the world economy, they know they came to the United States uh, for as a, safe, uh, as a safe haven. But on an ongoing basis, the evidence is very clear whether you're looking at uh, Reinhard Rogoff, you're looking at the IMF studies, you're looking at other studies, that a nation can only carry so much debt. And once it hits, you know, uh, 90, 100 percent of that, especially at the U.S. household level saving, things get bad pretty quickly. And by the way, even Japan had its lost decade. It's not like Japan is doing just thumbs up. I mean, they've had their, you know, they've had their, their pressures as well, even with their high national saving rate. And so the debt issue is, is I think, the, the issue uh, really facing our Economy. It's also another reason why we believe in a comprehensive modeling, not just tax, but the spending side, all of it together. Because, in fact, so much of the labeling doesn't matter. It, it, it's in many cases, yes, it can matter politically. I completely agree. 1983, trust fund's about to exhaust and so forth. But in terms of the economics, you really want to have a whole uh, comprehensive, you don't want specialized models. You really want a comprehensive uh, framework that uh, recognizes that a pay-as-you-go program is like that. Okay, one more quick question, because yeah. we are a little over time, yeah. so let's do this quickly. Yeah. Um, what is one critical, uh, one critical assumption that you make in your model, and you know, how do you handle arriving at the appropriate assumption? In terms of uh, reporting to the Congress, I think the most critical assumption, uh, and this actually leads to consternation sometimes with the policy makers, is that we start from the present law baseline. Uh, and so that means we are supposed to take uh, as a fundamental assumption that what the law says is what it's going to be and that people will be responding according to what the law says. Now, that doesn't mean that the people might not have uncertainty about the future, but for example, since the reduction in uh, individual marginal tax rates and the changes in personal exemption, standard deduction, itemized uh, uh, deductions uh, are due to expire. That's a fundamental uh, assumption from which we work in terms of analyzing any future policy, uh, policy change. Uh, and um, I, I think that's really key uh, in terms of how, how we arrive at that. That's easy. <laughs> it's, it's, the, it's the baseline that's used by uh, the Joint Committee. It's used by the Congressional Budget Office for the purpose of reporting the expenditure side. It has the uh, benefit of putting analysis of different proposals on an, e on an equal footing. I would say our, our most critical assumption depends on whether you're looking at long-term or short-term. 
If we're looking long term, it's all about demographics. It's about that age distribution. And for that, it's principally what are the birth rates going to be? Uh, and also immigration. What is immigration going to be? Those are the two contributors towards people coming in at the younger ages. Death rates, they're pretty steady. They're, they're really they're a much, much sub-level issue. So in the long term, it's all about the age distribution, which is what are birth rates and immigration going to be? In the shorter term, it's really about, uh, it's about the revenue side. It's about in the economy, are there going to be workers? How much money are they making? If you look back when the recession came and everybody was, was concerned about the disability insurance trust fund taking a big hit, I think it was something like 90 plus percent of the hit on the disability insurance trust fund was from less revenue coming in because we had less workers and less earnings that was resulting in taxes and less than 10 percent of it was from more people getting disability benefits. So in the near term, it's all about the economy, workers, and employment. Longer term, it's all about demographics. Yeah. Uh, for us, uh, certainly the openness of the economy uh, dominates even the elasticity estimates that academics have often cared about. Academics have, including myself, have done tons of work assuming revenue neutral changes in tax law, and that, that is just very far from you know, reality. And so, in particular, uh, the, the openness of the economy actually is much more important than some of the elasticities. Having said that, that's something a user can play with. What we've kind of hard-coded in, coming back to it, Tom's uh, a, a very important, uh, it's, it's subtle but incredibly important point, is that as modelers, should, uh, on one hand, we could say, you know what, this is how Congress is going to behave. They're not really going to do this. And so, but at the same time, that's not our job to play Congress and say this is how they're going to ch change the law. So the current law assumption is kind of what we're as bean counters and having better, you know, good models and so forth. That's what that's our obligation. At the same time, uh, one of the things that we do with the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act is we said, okay, suppose though that people have the expectations, we will still model it as current law. But people have expectations that certain, some of the provisions that will sunset will, in fact, be extended. It actually turns out that didn't change things dramatically. Um, that, that issue has dominated everything. But still, you know, that is a valid point, and that is it can, it can certainly have an effect. And that's something that we didn't have as a dial control um, in our simulations. All right. Well, thank you very thank you. much. Um, this is really informative. Um, everyone, if you can join us for lunch in the atrium, um, there is some limited seating, and so there's additional seating available um, in HVC 201 around the corner um, if that becomes necessary. Uh, so come, enjoy your lunch. And the lunch will be great. It's, it's going to be a great conversation <laughs> on trade. <laughs> so, so glad to be here.